thank you very much for coming. Um, and it's really wonderful to see so many young investigators here at the University of Rochester and Arts, Sciences, Engineering especially. We understand that we're about 40% young new faculty of our faculty in Arts and Sciences as of last year. So you're going to be making a huge impact both at our institution and hopefully in science and discovery. So we just want to start with uh, introductions. First of all, I introduce Dean David Williams, who's our Dean for Research. I hope that you all know him and love him as we do. Cindy Gary, who's Assistant Dean of Grants and Contracts for the School of Engineering. And myself, Deborah Herring, I'm Assistant Dean for Grants and Contracts for Arts and Sciences. Welcome, everyone. Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, see you all here, and I welcome you to this workshop, which I think, I hope will be valuable. I won't take up very much of your time. I know you didn't come here to uh, listen to a, an administrator drone on. Uh, but I did want to make the, pay, the point that I'm not just an administrator. I'm also a scientist. Um, and I uh, work in, I'm the director of the Center for Visual Science, and I work in the field of vision science. And I wanted to, uh, if you'll indulge me, just say a few words about the early stages of my own career to emphasize just how important the kind of activities that you're here to learn about, more about. Um, can ha just how those activities can be useful. And I wanted to start by introducing Thomas Young, who many of you I'm sure are aware of, uh, an incredibly brilliant um, person from Cambridge University, Englishman from Cambridge, who made contributions to our understanding of uh, deciphering hier hieroglyphics. He developed uh, key, did key experiments on, on the wave theory of light, um, and he made very important contributions to color vision among many, many other contributions. The guy was incredibly productive and, and uh, has been always one of my heroes in science. Uh, so uh, the area that Thomas Young was working on in 1802 that was seminal, really important, and a, a sort of foundation for what I eventually ended up doing was uh, captured in this nice paper, this brilliant paper, really, on the theory of lights and colors. And Thomas Young proposed in that paper was really the first clear articulation of the notion that we see through three fundamental channels, that color vision is based on three kinds of cones. And uh, what Thomas Young wasn't able to show was what those channels were like and how they were distributed in the retina and develop any, anything, more, anything like an elaborate theory of how color coding occurs in the, uh, in the human eye. And that was really where I started as a, as a graduate student, was to try to understand that. And ultimately, about two decades later, uh, was able to take the first pictures that showed all three classes of cone photoreceptor uh, in the eye. So here you see the red, green, blue cones uh, that we now know and well <clears throat> in a paper published in Nature in the, in, the, uh, in the late 90s. And I show you this because uh, I want to make it clear how Thomas Young's ideas were being received about the time that he published this really impressive paper that's now a classic in the field of vision science. And so here are a couple of uh, anonymous reviews on, on, uh, this, on, on papers that he published around th this time that were equally important uh, as this one. Uh, one review said, this paper contains nothing which deserves the name either of experiment or of discovery and as it is in fact destitute of every species of merit. And then another quote is, we now dismiss for the present the feeble lucubrations of this author in which we have searched without success for some traces of learning, acuteness, and ingenuity that might compensate his evident deficiency in the powers of solid thinking, calm, and patient investigation. Now, what this shows, first of all, of course, is that peer review was alive and well in 1802. Um, but it also uh, may remind you of some of the reviews early in your career that you might be receiving that aren't always as positive as one would like. And I wanted to show this to you because um, even people like Thomas Young can get reviews of this kind and don't be discouraged. And what I, in fact, recommend to uh, a, a young faculty is to put these quotes above their computer screen. And when those negative reviews come in, um, it's just additional evidence that you're an unrecognized genius like Thomas Young. <laughs> so, so really, uh, the, the, the point is, is really to encourage you to per persevere. This is a, the kind of thing we're talking about today, seeking these uh, prestigious uh, career awards, early career awards of various kinds that you'll hear in great detail about in a, in a moment. Um, uh, they're very competitive and very hard to get, as you know. 
but they can be hugely valuable for your career. I was able, doing work related to this that eventually led to this result many years later, uh, I was able to get <laughs> one of these um, uh, early career awards from the National Institute, and I got five years of funding and release from teaching for five years, and it was uh, a remarkable boost to my own career. And the one point I wanted to make to you is that as competitive as these are and as difficult as they are to get, if you get them, get even one of them, it's a kind of gift that keeps on giving. No matter, no, not only do you get the initial benefit of having that award, but future awards become easier and easier. And we see this all the time in, in our efforts to secure honorific awards as well as funding for faculty in art sciences engineering that, um, that we, you know, the people that are consistently getting awards um, have a much better chance of continuing to get them. And so early in your career, if you can log one of these things, get, get one of these awards uh, uh, on your CV, it can be enormously um, uh, helpful for the remainder of your career. So uh, I'll turn it over to the, uh, the real experts here, but I did want to um, uh, thank you for coming again because this is very important not only for your individual careers, but for the University of Rochester that we can uh, brag about all the um, prestigious awards that, we, uh, that our, our junior faculty uh, bring to the university. Uh, and it just makes this a much more exciting and vibrant place than it already is. So thanks so much, and I hope, uh, I hope this is a successful day for you. Okay, um, we're gonna jump right in. I thought what I'd do quickly is um, just reinforce the agenda that we have and we'll try to stay on time because huge value is gonna be from our panel that we've got uh, as the last session. We're very excited to have the mix and breadth of people that we uh, have agreed to be part of the workshop this morning. Um, and really as a way of introduction, show you and what we think you should expect today and feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, this workshop is an evolution. We <coughs> did a workshop two years ago that's taped, so you can find it on YouTube, um, that was only on the NSF Career Award primarily, and we just subtly touched on other young investigator funding opportunities. And so what we uh, did in this workshop today Again, we're taping it, so you'll be able to re see it on YouTube and, and go back to it as a reference. But we are really working on showing you multiple funding opportunities for young investigators. And the takeaway is that young investigator is defined by every agency differently. So you can't assume that if you meet the criteria for the National Science Foundation for a young investigator, that it's the same for the Air Force or for DARPA or for NIH. So you have to be very careful in looking at what constitutes eligibility and look at what's gonna uh, be a fit for you. We've also put together in Art Sciences and Engineering um, a reference that you can go to off our website um, and that's other places. It, it's referenced in their materials here. Um, that is a catalog and an inventory of multiple types of young investigator funding opportunities. And we're not covering all of them in our session today, but we wanted to highlight, you know, a dozen-ish so that you could see um, the breadth and what might be um, for you. So I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to talk about um, DOE, Department of Energy, several of the defense agencies, uh, and NASA. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah, and Deborah's gonna cover NIH, NSF career, and several of the foundation funding opportunities. And what I did, and I didn't uh, have all, and they're all vis-a-vis -vis available via um, what the web, but I've got several of the solicitations on the back table for you know, DOE, some of the ones that you may not be familiar with. Um, as we were prepping for the session or had them on hand because we're working on some of these right now. Um, some of those uh, program announcements are on the back table. So at the, we are gonna have a very small break um, in between when we talk and when we have the panel kind of set up. Um, but feel free to go back and look at them, you know, flip through and put them back. Um, they're for your purpose to use or take a quick look if you have any questions and wanna really look at any details. So for the DOE, Department of Energy, um, that um, is a program that comes out every year. It's annual. And it's weird because what they do is 
you know, the, the timing is generally the same, although I wanted to point out that um, the pre-application is due in September. Um, and then always this proposal is due around Thanksgiving, if invited. So it's, we always have to, we are scrambling, we're always working on this one right before Thanksgiving to get it in. Um, the funding, this is a five-year funding opportunity. And the eligibility, um, you can see what it is. Um, the, the nice one, the nice thing about DOE is that you can have other career like funding from other agencies. Um, some other agencies aren't as kind as the DOE, and there's no letters of recommendation. That's a, a big key, which is unusual. One of the things in all of these young investigator applications is that you really have to immerse yourself and spend some time understanding what the mission is for that particular agency and making sure you're using the right language and buzzwords. Um, every agency is organized differently. Um, some are by divisions, some are by directorates, but they all have uh, technical focus areas. And um, for the Department of Energy, and I don't want to stand in front of you guys, um, you know, you can see we have these areas map up very well to some of the STEM areas that we have um, here at the University of Rochester. Uh, fusion, high energy physics is an example. Review criteria. So you can see how this is an imp important, the other takeaway is to understand if an agency is using peer reviewers or if they're using internal reviewers themselves, not using a peer review system. So DOE uses peer review. Many of the other defense agencies, as you see as we go fast through, do not use peer review. They use internal um, and may pull in an outside expert if necessary. The requirements. Uh, one takeaway for DOE is that they have their own online system called PAMS and you have to register for that. Um, it's their fast lane, if you will, um, that the NSF uses. And these are the, the pieces. Um, um, and it's fairly straightforward uh, as far as the, the kinds of um, documents that are required. Um, and you'll see fairly consistent info that's required. So. Also, you can repurpose you know, your bio sketch and other things that you're using for another submission and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. So DOE tips, um, start early, you have to register for this PAM system. We've had recent winners, in fact, one of our panelists you'll hear from on the DOE, so if you're interested, ask, ask, um, ask some questions about uh, that. But know that this is a very competitive program. They make very few awards so it's, it, the competition is tight. Um, we have somebody here that's um, been recommended for funding in this last round. We just haven't got the official word, so we're very excited about that. Um, so that's for DOE. Um, Air Force, Young Investigator. It's open right now. We've got several people working on this as we speak. Uh, it's due June 1st. Um, the funding, three years, 100K, 150K a year. The eligibility is slightly different. It's got a much um, shorter window of who's eligible in, a, in certain time frames. And um, just know that this is, this can, you can get um, additional funding for this, um, but you have to get through the first hurdle of getting accepted for funding first. Here's the mission and divisions for Air Force. They tend to stay steady on uh, that change. Um, <clears throat> that's the other thing in defense agencies there doesn't tend to be a whole lot of change so when the solicitations are in the off season meaning they're not open and on the street for submission it's a really good time to reach into a program manager to see if you're a fit from a technical perspective um, you can see their review criteria and note that this is reviewed in, in, in house as they say, they don't use a peer review process. Looks like a fairly common list to the DOE, you know, similar um, requirements and pieces that are, are pushed into the, the grand site of system. And here's some tips. There's a lot of good intel on Air Force on um, various websites and links. They do publish their lists of awardees by year. 
um, and you'll have copies of the slides you'll see you'll be able to use the links but you can go back and you can see if you've had peers people that you know on the outside that have been funded um, we've not had a lot of success with Air Force here at, at the University of Rochester we have submitted um, not 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 very many I would say um, it's been very targeted and and that's um, not un that's not, not surprising to us that we haven't had um, a lot of a lot of success in this space so DARPA um, defense advanced research projects agency for those that may not know um, this program comes out every year the schedule of it has slid a little bit it's changed it hasn't always been consistent to what we saw last year it was earlier in the year um, we expect with a continuing resolution that passed this week with Congress that generally speaking these dates are going to be be held to with regards to when we expect to see the solicitations for the next round come through there was some question about that if we didn't have a budget that passed but now that we do and it's um, it's through the beginning to the fiscal year um, the next federal fiscal year and these things if they come out before that they're they're fairly solid but again we we are not beholden to know what's going to happen in the fall um, so this is our best guess um, as to when the the timing of when these solicitations will come out uh, when the deadlines based on history budget fairly straightforward you can see the eligibility uh, US citizenship is important in, in DARPA their mission and divisions and we just had uh, the acting director here uh, from DARPA did did people hear her I think you know I saw quite a few people in the room so we got a really great overview and have that presentation that we've made available so you can see how DARPA is organized is checked because I thought like as, as of last year I thought it was the only but the only part either permanent residency at all. We can check it. I have the solicitation in the back, but this is off the this is off their program announcement. And you know if there's questions and that's where we see oftentimes and we'll do follow ups that's you know Deborah and I oftentimes will field a question about citizenship or if or an eligibility in particular. And if a faculty member um, doesn't want to uh, show their hand so to speak we're very happy to submit in those types of questions to the agency on your behalf and, and it's a smart thing to do because we don't want you know if there's an issue or something that can be resolved actually too between the time that you're looking at submitting and when it would go would be submitted we that's good intel to know and we're very happy to play that role so that you don't have to do it I just wanted to mention that even though you'll get the slides afterwards, the DOE actually does not have, unusually, does not have a citizen re uh, requirement. So that for anyone who's in the process of uh, getting their residency, that could be a great, a great option. Their review criteria very straightforward. Um, and another note in the defense side is that they really care about the research program, the research element in in the student that you're supporting in the training of those into their pipeline there isn't a big education plan push or outreach push like you're going to hear in NSF um, the defense agencies don't care so much about that there's this opportunity to put in a one-page executive summary to get feedback on a go no-go we had uh, several people do that this year and it can save time and energy to hear one way or the other um, what DARPA thinks before submitting a full proposal <laughs> technically you can submit the full proposal without submitting this executive summary but if you get feedback of a no-go you know I would recommend that you don't right <laughs> however you could you DARPA. could but you could <laughs> um, that they have their own uh, DARPA uh, friendly site where you submit uh, directly to DARPA so you have to get registered on that site so you just have to build that into your timeline um, and just be cognizant of that that's new uh, it was new with DARPA last year in all their submissions not just their young investigator and some t and some people just don't they're just accustomed to doing it the old way um, through grants that go over submitting something by email to DARPA directly as a PDF now there's an online portal that you have to register for and know that 
uh, for DARPA, they have what's called a technical proposal and a cost proposal, and there's much more detail in a DARPA cost proposal than what would you'd see in a standard by year NSF formatted proposal or NIH. They care about it by year, um, by task, <laughs> um, and, and so it takes more time um, and by month. So we've, we've cracked the code, so to speak, on these budgets, and we have good templates. Um, and we can provide those to be helpful to you should you want to be, should you submit to DARPA. Because it takes more thought and um, thinking about how it's presented uh, to them um, in, in addition to the standard by year approach. Cindy, did you, did you say that you expect it to be due in January next year? The DARPA? DARPA right. The timing was last year, yeah. But you said something about you expect it to slide or to maintain? It, we expect right now everything to stay the same unless there's a government shutdown. <laughs> what we saw, what we saw happen three years ago when there was, you know, it wasn't the government shutdown wasn't very long; it was weeks. Um, was that because of that the solicitations pushed out? And so right now we're working on the assumption that this is the schedule, but should that change in the government shutdown? Sometimes they could try to get it in ahead. We've, we've seen that approach as well, that they want to get things done and out in a call before there could be a government shutdown. In fact, the National Science Foundation is pu has been pushing some of their deadlines earlier. And also some of their responses to some of their uh, decisions, rather, uh, funding decisions we've noticed come in much faster than we you know, normally would assume. So, so you have to be very, very cognizant in these times that we're in to be looking at what the deadline dates are. And we're doing our best to give you what we've seen without a new solicitation out on the streets, just given history. But we don't have a magic ball to know that that's exactly what it's going to be. So you really have to be on top of um, these particular, if there's a t an agency or two or three that you care about, make sure you're on their, you're reviewing their sites and looking at and you're on their um, uh, mailing list. We've got to believe that, you know, friend, excuse me, why, but we've got to believe that with the current administration that we have, that any of the defense related agencies are going to remain alive after the new budget. I mean, we don't anticipate based on, you know, kind of, I mean, we're not, again, we're not seers. You know, we just, based on what we're seeing and what we're hearing about this administration, it would be very unlikely if defense spending was cut, and therefore we assume that the defense. Uh, agencies are going to be continued to be funded. So we asked this question of Stephanie actually when she was here about DARPA. I mean, you know, what what's the future? And you know, she she has to um, give the political line and say we expect it to be what it's been in the past, and that's what we anticipate, and that's how, that's as much as we can do from a planning perspective. So we know that you know we're on we were on a continuing resolution. Now the budget is passed. We know that we're good until the fall. Um, through the new fiscal, the government fiscal year, we'll see what our presidential uh, administration comes up with for the new budget. And why do you have anything? Do you have any intel? Anything else? No, I just was. I mean, the DARPA seems highly topical, right? So it is. If you don't fit, then you basically don't have the yeah. so. Yeah. Um, Very targeted. It'd be nice to see. I mean, I guess there's not much you can do, but if there's some way to understand what those are going to be, right? In the future yeah. Years. Well, one thing you can do is if you have a you know, fantastic idea, and Stephanie Tompkins mentioned this, if you have a, you know, breakthrough idea, you can contact who you think now is the regular, exactly. you know, the program officer and try to pitch that idea. They have other mechanisms besides the early career. The early career is actually a much more standard program, but they have other mechanisms for, you know, fast breakthrough kind of science. So NASA, um, they actually, their solicitation comes out under, as an appendix, and that's why I have that in parentheses in the title, under a broader um, agency announcement. And so it's important to keep, I keep, we keep track of that uh, to know when they, they came out. And so I just am sharing what the dates were. Um, so it's not like they make a big splash about their, their um, early career faculty solicitation coming out. They push out an appendix of something that's already out there. And, and so it's, it's really important to stay on top of that. They have uh, what's called their Inspires website, uh, and you can look at and see, and they have this massive, they, their roses solicitation is what they call it, um, and just stay on top of that. 
Again, citizenship, you know, again, if there's questions, we're happy to check into it if, it, if you care and, and want us to do that. The mission, um, fairly straightforward. I did make a note at the bottom of the slide that there's a couple of other programs that are not, um, that, that are for the early career um, investigator that are also for innovations and things, and they have standard calls. They have very topic-driven um, calls here, and um, as an example, this year there were only four topics. I just put up a few of them um, because Amy put, put, we submitted, you submitted, um, you know, what, six weeks ago? When did it go in? Yeah. The um, last, not the last day, a couple of days. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to the photonics, to that first topic. And so again, very targeted topics uh, within NASA. The review criteria um, with peer review um, make very few awards, so it's highly competitive. Standard requirements for the application, the one thing is that they refer to and use something called their, um, it's their NASA guidebook, which really they, you have to do a, a go-between like you do with NIH to understand the key um, pieces that are required. And um, they also have their own system, Inspires, um, that requires um, advanced registration for it's very easy. And they have a couple things that are required um, that are, on, or you know, this uh, overview chart, which they give a format. Um, and you can look and see um, who the previous winners have been. Um, and we haven't had anyone that's been a NASA awardee in not, recent. Not, not recently, but we, we definitely had in the past. ONR, Office of Naval Research, uh, another defense agency. Um, you know, their timing has been pretty standard with respect to when we've seen their, their BAA come out uh, and do. And, you know, three years of funding. Um, eligibility again um, changed slightly to some others and just be cognizant of that um, their mission and I would say on the ONR front that they've done a really good job of reorganizing their website that maps to what you're seeing here in this um, science and tech areas and it's you can drill in and you can find who's who a program manager is in any particular area based on these codes and that's a good place to start uh, trying to make a, a match to a, a research area that you think would be a good fit. Their review criteria, note that they are not peer reviewed and that in an ONR application the requirement for a letter is from the institution and what commitment uh, will be made and, and we often work on those letters on behalf of uh, the dean um, or uh, the vice president for research um, to think about what is the best way to handle that letter and the kinds of things that we want to include. So if you're thinking ONR, let us know. We can be helpful and be working on that um, in, in collaboration with your department chair and, and the types of things that uh, we understand just given history and experience and seeing great letters and thinking about what would make sense for you. Standard sections. Uh, there's nothing that is unusual for ONR in their application. And then tips, you can, you can really reach in, you can see who um, have been the awardees, you can drill in, look at lists, see who's been funded in your research area. Um, it's hard to know what um, division they picked at ONR, you can't, you can't map that, but our experience has been if there's somebody on the list that looks like it's in the same space that you're in, people have been very willing to share. It's been amazing. Um, and, and in fact, just to even have a call to understand who they, what, what directorate or division they submitted to um, and any, anything they might be able to, to share to include uh, their winning proposal. And we've had success in this area of ONR. Um, but again, the, and the success rate isn't crazy bad. You know, it's not like some of the other ones, I, I would say. So um, if, if you mapped ONR, it's, it's worth a shot. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about NIH and NSF and then a couple of the um, foundational opportunities. Um, I'm going to go through, again, this pretty quickly, you know, kind of in the same way that, um, that uh, Cindy did. So the K Awards, there's actually a whole series of them. The reason why I highlighted the K01 is that we actually are going to have a panelist, Christy Petrenko, who is going to be speaking on her experience 
uh, having um, applied for and received uh, a K-01. But N NIH is very, very concerned with um, the amount of funding that's been going to senior investigators. And they have several other mechanisms besides the whole case series, which is for young investigators. Um, they also have an early uh, career kind of status for investigators. So even on R01, you might get a little credit for that, or you certainly will be reviewed amongst your peers. So NIH is very friendly to um, to young investigators and sees as part of his mission, its mission to uh, increase kind of the pipeline of the next generation of the workforce. But uh, here is the current parent um, parent um, announcement. Um, it's worth noting that not every institute in the National Institutes of Health, Institutes of Health, plural, um, has the K01 award as, the, as their early career. NIGMS, I believe, has like the K12 as their early career. But anything in the K series is a career development or advancement. Uh, so there are, um, you know, as you become more senior, there are uh, K awards for um, switching your area of expertise and needing to train for something new. There's a sabbatical program. I don't think that's actually in the K space, but there are other, there's about 10 of them. I have a handout that I'll put back with, um, with Cindy's stuff. Um, so it's very important to make sure that the institute that you're applying to um, actually supports the K. Yes? I have a question about faculty that are on the river campus, and some of this may vary based on department. So in the K series, from my understanding, you're supposed to devote something like 80% to... 75. Research. 75, okay. Right. And so based on one's teaching load and the pace, based on the department that you're in and teaching reduction needed and all of that... Correct. Um, ...can vary based on department, and so right. I didn't know if there's any guidance. For right. So really, NIH, I mean, it follows, you know, pretty, obviously we have tons of, and I, we are, uh, NIH is our cognizant agency, we have tons of NIH funding. Um, what I would say is that, you know, met some of the programs seem more geared towards a medical center type faculty member rather than a river campus, uh, art sciences and engineering faculty. Christy Petrenko herself is, an, is a research professor, so she's not um, teaching, I mean, she's mentoring, but I don't think she's teaching formal courses. All I can say is that if you were to receive a, a prestigious award like this, it's worth negotiating with your chair and with your, um, and with our dean to be able to accept the award. I mean, it's not set in stone that you might not, that you might be able, you might be able to get teaching relief in order to accept the award. And it's only the mentored part, the first couple of years of the award, that requires, I believe, the 75% uh, research. But there are ways to kind of work it out um, with, you know, hiring um, adjuncts or getting teaching relief so that we will help you kind of be able to accept this award. But the, but the example that we have today of Christy is that she is not in a full-time professorial and, te and teaching uh, capacity at the moment. So here's the NIH mission. Um, the purpose of the Mentored Research Science Development Award is to support and protected time, three, four, or five years for intensive research. So if that's your love and that's your passion, again, I really urge you to try to negotiate with your chair, try to negotiate with, your, um, with the dean to be able to accept this award. Um, and these are the um, institutes listed here who actually do have, who do accept applications to the parent K01 program. Here are the review criterion. Um, NIH has, yes, sorry, Lisa. I happen to know what the funding amounts are for like the, the research funds that come along with the K01 are, right? I don't offhand, but I have the, I think I have the announcement here. Um, it is, it is 250, but there's a, there are additional supplements for the research as well. And there's actually a supplement, in some programs there's a supplement for the mentor. As long so as it's covering your salary for if you're in the med center or something, right? So yeah. if you're in a hard money line, is it different? Again, I think it's, I think you have to negotiate that. I mean, I think, again, if you're getting teaching relief, it may be that the dean, the dean or your chair will want you to cover part of your salary because it's allowable with NIH. Um, so in any case, NIH has very, very clear uh, review criterion, and they're listed all over their website. And basically, the K award follows everything that one would expect in an R01, an R03, an R21, except that there is this mentored research section that's key. And this is the section that hopefully you'll have one or more mentors that they actually write with you and present. It's actually a plan for how they're going to mentor you through um, the new uh, field of research that you're uh, interested in pursuing.
And then this is required for the application. Um, we are now using ASSIST at the University of Rochester. You can apply through grants.gov, but I would really, really urge anyone who's applying to anything at NIH to use ASSIST. It's much easier. It's a web-based system, and uh, it's much easier to check for errors. You won't be caught unawares on the last day if you're not abiding by the uh, ORPA policy. You won't be caught unawares about any um, errors because you can check the errors as you go along. You can also parse out certain sections of ASSIST to different people. So if you have a staff member who's helping you with the budget, you can give them access to the budget and so on. All of these career awards are individual awards. I want to stress that. So unlike regular research awards where you can have co-PIs and you can have, there are a couple of them where you could have a collaborator, um, but a co-PI is really not uh, part of the early career kind of lexicon, if you will. And here's some tips. First of all, NIH has one of, they have a huge website, which they've just reorganized. They have a wealth of information on their website. Really anything that you need to know in terms of nuts and bolts about NIH, in addition to all the people who've been funded here and everyone in ORPA and myself and Cindy, you can really find the information uh, very well explained on their website. In addition to just plain text, they also have, all, they have a whole section on how to write a successful proposal. There's a mock uh, panel review, which is really excellent, really worth an hour or two. There are podcasts about different subjects, so, you know, very interactive and really a wealth of information. Uh, again, we are a DHHS school, so we have a lot of people who've been funded. We have a number of people who've been funded by K Awards, so it's worth contacting them. We can find that information for you and let you know who they are. Um, again, I want to stress that we do encourage assist. You'll just find it. You'll love it once you do it. Um, there are two regional seminars targeting primarily young investigators, could also be senior investigators, could also be administrators. They're twice a year. They're, there's one actually happening right now. I think it was the third to the fifth. Um, but the next one is going to be in Baltimore. So I really urge you, if you're, if you're in NIH space, I really urge you to, it's worth spending a little, you know, a day or two to meet program officers at NIH and sort of hear what they have to say. Um, NIH provides um, extensive uh, reviews back to um, faculty, and unlike the other mechanisms that we showed, there is not a re there is a resubmission process per se. It may not fit. In other words, you might be too senior, you may have aged out of the K program, but it's worthwhile um, taking those reviews into account. You know, thinking about what the reviewers have said and resubmitting. And again, I just urge you to make sure that the institute that you're interested in applying to does, has the program. We've actually encountered this where we've prepared whole proposals and oops, at the end, uh, we found out that that institute is not accepting those kinds of proposals, not necessarily K. Okay, so the Career Award. Again, this is a program that when we started out a couple of years ago, or you know, Cindy and I started out six or seven years ago, there was actually very little inform, you know, great information about career, but that has really changed. NSF now provides all kinds of information and tutorials um, so we'll get to that in just a minute, but this is the basic program. This is the program for this summer, and these are the dates, um, the basic budget. Uh, one myth that people, I think, don't understand about careers, you can have a federally funded grant and still apply for career if you meet these criteria. It does not need to be your first federally funded research grant. So you could have a regular NSF or you could be on somebody else's NSF and still apply for the career. You can only apply though three times. So you need to sort of strategize when are the best before you become tenured, uh, when are, let's say, you know, that takes six or seven years before you become tenured, you know, it may not be worth it to do it the first year you hit the ground running in, at Rochester. You might want to wait till your third, fourth, and fifth year. You might want to do it the second year, take a break for a year, kind of mull over the critiques you receive, get your career, get your lab, you know, up and running better, more students, whatever, and then do it the, the fourth and the fifth year, for example. Um, we've been very, very successful in this um, in this uh, program. Just one um, word of advice again, kind of echoing what, um, what Cindy said, is that one of the um, requirements for this program is you must have a two-page letter from the chair. We have great examples of wonderful letters from the chair. It's the only letter of support that's allowed, so it's important that it be the best letter. If you have a chair who's not a good writer or doesn't write good letters with support for you or you have an inkling that may not, your chair's not one of those. I know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, or you can write the letter yourself. <laughs> but, but I, would, I, would, I would say that we, we have several new chairs, right? We have some, you know, in the scheme of our sciences and engineering, and of course they have access to previous letters and often, but they also want to look at best practice, and they're very open to seeing and working on with us on behalf of that application to really strengthen the letter. 
So the key in that is to not wait. It's if you know you're going to be asking, you're submitting a career, and you're going to the required letter. Let your department chair know, and some of them need no help. But you know, some of them are very open to mm -hmm. help, um, particularly the new chairs. Exactly, or if they've never done it before. So in Earth and Environmental Science, for example, a couple of years ago, Carmen Garzian was the chair, and she just asked for a couple of examples so she could sort of mull them over. We anonymized them. We sent her some examples. She sent me her letter. I made some tweaks, some added some contributions of things that I had seen in other letters, sent it back. Um, or the other way is to do what Ellen did, who is, is a recent career awardee. <laughs> Yay! Uh, and write your own letter. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, the limit for the number of submissions, is it only for NSF or other DOE or? It depends on the agency. It depends on the agency. I, there's one other agency that has a limit. Yeah, I think they're in the slides. There was one that you can only submit two times. I think it might have been uh, one of the Department of Defense ones. Yeah. I don't think it was the Department of Energy. Correct. But, you know, if they don't get you by the number of times that, you're, that you can submit, they might get you because you need to be a certain number of years uh, beyond your terminal PhD or a number of years in your first appointment or your first or second appointment. Correct. So you have to really kind of fit into that. Um, these are the NSF missions and divisions. Um, one thing that's very important to note about the NSF as opposed to these others that we've been presenting to you today is NSF really takes the mission of um, broadening impacts, broadening participation, and the educational, the ed educational piece of the, um, of the uh, proposal very seriously. And so that's a little bit different, especially for the Department of Defense, which are very, very focused on uh, you know, very test driven, very experiment driven, very science driven. It's very important to the NSF that it be the highest quality science as well, but there is this component of education that's, um, that's very important to them. So these are the directorates. Uh, you know, all of us here in art sciences and engineering fit into one of these directorates. For, since I know we have a couple of um, psychologists here, it, it actually needs to be regular psychology, not clinical, can't be a clinical trial or something. Is there a history of people who are, are clinical psychologists? I mean, I mean, I guess I'm wondering like where that line is. Is it, is, is it I'm sure they don't want intervention work, mm -hmm. but if you study like... You can have human subjects. Mm -hmm. right. So if there are humans involved, that's fine. But if you're investigating things like depression or things that are um, psychopathology related, is that... It's not an issue. It's not an issue for NSF, no. I think it's really how you spin your research project. The other thing that's important to note about NSF is, and, and, and actually all of these young investigator grants is that, but especially NSF, I would say, you know, each of them have like a slightly different nuance and a slightly different spin. So NSF really wants to see the development of five years of research and how that's going to get you from being, you know, yesterday a postdoc or a first year or second, third year professor to being, you know, kind of a, mid, a more of a mid career. So they really want to see this trajectory. Tra trajectory in your research of how your program is going to grow and how it's going to evolve and how it's going to develop. So for NSF, especially on the clinical side, you have to make sure, you know, that you're not going to be doing anything that's too clinical that would be sort of in the NIH space in those five years. But what does it count as being too clinical? You really have to talk to your program officer. It's really very nuanced um, and I, and you know, we have the same issue that arises with all the graduate students who apply for the GRFP, you know, they're in psychology, but they are working with human subjects and so on. I think it's, it is very nuanced. Um, I think that the main point I think is that NSF has less funding than NIH. NIH is the agency with, you know, billions of dollars that supports um, clinical studies. So I think you just have to walk that fine line. But we have had, uh, we ha certainly have had people both students receive the GRFP from the NSF, and we've had um, people in clinical and social sciences and psychology uh, receive the career. We're, we're very successful at this. U of R has been very successful at this. Yes? Sorry, just to follow Louise's question. Do you know if they were clinical folks, though? Because I, I have heard, like, so I know they like social and they like developmental. They like normative psychological processes, and mm -hmm. you can make the case that depression is at the end of a continuum, maybe, but in terms of clinical science, they want you to go to NIH. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing that you can do both, and it's a beautiful thing, within NIH and for NSF, you can see every award, every abstract to look at and see if you fit a profile of what you may be per submitting and see what's been funded. And you can also see who the program manager was who funded it. I mean, there's a lot of depth and breadth in 
what you can do in award searches. And that's a really important strategy for where that information is available for any of these agencies to see. And they break it out by the directorate here, which is very important. And there's a lot of information, as Deborah mentioned, on NSF career down to the probability of within certain directorates, um, how, you know, are they, are they awarding 18% or, you know, 8% of their career awards? So there's a lot of information to be seen that's publicly available. So these are the review criteria. criteria and what we're hearing more and more, and what we heard at the Young Investigator uh, NSF session that we, uh, that we attended last fall, was that NSF is now really looking for transformative concepts and transformative research. You know, what is transformative is, I guess, subject to interpretation. But um, they're looking for that, and they are looking for that um, in the uh, career program as well. But again, couched in the context of that you are a young investigator, and this is what you're planning on doing for five years. The other thing I wanted to mention about the NSF career is that unlike the standard NSF grant, uh, and, and like a standard NIH research grant, it is five years of stable funding. So um, it, it provides an advantage in that respect, as well as being all of these young investigators are considered to be, in addition to the actual funding, huge awards and uh, CV worthy. Uh, so it's another advantage. These are the requirements, fairly standard, fast lane for now. In a couple of years, we're going to be kind of uh, evolving to research.gov, but for the moment, it's in fast lane. For this year, definitely in fast lane. Everything that you would expect from an NSF, except that only one supplementary doc is allowed, and that is the chair's letter. Um, if you have estimates for equipment and they don't fit in the budget justification, you can append those. Um, one word of uh, warning for NSF, for all NSF, but also for the career. If you have collaborators, and again, none of these programs expect you to have a co-PI because these are your individual award, and they are portable for the most part. So if you receive this and you decide tomorrow that you're leaving U of R, you take your award with you because it's an award to you based on your promise, your research, your career development. If you have collaborators, NSF now has a very, very specific kind of language. Basically, what they're interested in knowing is that you have actually discussed with whoever you're putting in your narrative as being your collaborator, and they have agreed to collaborate. Believe it or not, a lot of times people just sign other folks up on their proposals and you know forget to in the mad rush to get it all in never talk to them and get their official agreement so that's really the purpose of the collaboration it's not you're beautiful you're wonderful you're the smartest person in the world it's not uh, even necessarily what they're going to do but that they they have agreed to be your collaborator but in the case of the career i i would advise against it really the important letter is the chair's letter so some tips, we've talked a few tips kind of throughout this whole section on career, but there is a ton of information about it. Cindy had mentioned earlier that we have a recorded 2015 workshop that we did an entire morning like this with panelists who are very successful at career. Um, and that's available on our research website. It's available also in the intranet. We can also email it to you. Um, it's about two and a half hours and it's worth your time. NSF actually now is providing a webinar and there's one coming up very soon on May 22nd. Um, so you get to at least sort of see via video cam the different program officers who you might then contact. Um, and they have a lot of good information. Um, they don't have panelists, but they certainly are quite frank in what they're looking for. They talk about what makes a good proposal, what doesn't make a good proposal. They talk a lot about broader impacts, which is where we sometimes struggle. And my one word of advice is really take the broader impacts in the educational. For NSF, really take this part seriously. And we have, in the Dean's Office, uh, created a compendium of all kinds of great resources here at the institution for both evaluation, for evaluating your educational plan, and also for broader impacts. And that also resides on the um, ASNE research website. It's also in the internet. I'll show you those places in a few moments. Um, what we advise faculty to do, and, and we've said this um, in some other sessions, is to try to work with what we have ongoing at the institution. If you have a burning desire to you know, work at school 25 with fourth graders, you know, then certainly go at it. But we have so many programs that are institutionally supported by either the Kern Center or the Warner School, um, or you know, possibly even in your own departments. It's worthwhile to kind of plug into those because the benefit to you is that a lot of the assessment, a lot of the tracking of those students, data from previous students who've been in the program, you'll be able to kind of utilize all, all of that information. You won't have to kind of start from the word go. So um, we Can have- Can you uh, give an example of one of these 
So for example, we have a program here at the Kearns that's run through the Kern Center. We have actually three programs called Upward Bound. It's a high school to college, underrepresented minorities kind of uh, program where, gosh, I don't even know how many students. I, you know, every, each program, we have three programs. One is classic, one is math and science, and then we, we're, we just submitted for one for vets. Um, and so it's basically a summer school for high schoolers, junior and senior high schoolers, where they have a college experience. They actually learn. Um, and the current centers manages all of the student recruitment, all of the assessment, um, all of the evaluation. You may, you know, your part in it may be that you'll provide a mini course in your particular field of expertise and you may mentor a student or you may not. Um, another example would be that we have a relationship with the Warner School especially is now involved in administering East High. It's a little bit more, you have to be a little bit more careful. You have to go through kind of the Warner School and the person who is the liaison. But we have access to all of these students. Again, you don't need to recruit high schoolers. So this is a, a an urban uh, school that has mostly underrepresented minority students, and you know you might want to do a program there. We have contacts at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and we know the head of uh, the Department of Edu of the it's not really Department of Education, but their educational programming there, and um, he's very friendly to U of R and welcomes. You have our students and faculty coming and doing programming at the, the museum. So rather than you kind of spending the time to navigate those relationships, you know, plug into kind of what we have to offer. However, again, you're also welcome, of course, to do whatever you feel passionate about doing. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about foundational opportunities. This is a little bit of a, a, a very different animal than what we've uh, presented to you up until now. Um, there are many, many fun, uh, foundational opportunities for young investigators. In fact, I think of the limited submissions that we have, almost all of them are actually for young investigators. There are some nuances that you need to understand about applying to foundations. Um, some, many of them uh, are limited submissions. So what this means is that the institution receives an invitation, actually, because we are a tier one research university. Uh, receives an invitation to nominate uh, faculty. Sometimes we get one slot, sometimes we get two slots. Uh, most of them are limited submissions, so there's a sort of a pre-application process that's internal before you apply. Um, many of them, whether they're limited or not, do require some sort of uh, institutional official to endorse or provide a letter of recommendation to, or to actually submit uh, the proposal. So you need to kind of work with other people besides your departmental grants managers and ORPA. Um, for the limited submissions, the instructions for the internal applications, which, I, which you know, sounds scary, but actually they're very brief. One or two page abstract, your CV, a, a 350 word endorsement from your chair, so it's not a real big deal. Um, usually come out, most of them come out from the senior VP's office. Occasionally you'll get something that's not a limited submission, that's actually sent directly from Foundation Relations to your chair. They don't typically send out to all faculty. The important key here is to make sure, especially for young, fact, brand new faculty, make sure you're on the list. Um, we try to renew these lists all the time, um, and every time that we get you know, the new co cohort of new faculty, we try to make sure that ORPA gets their email, uh, their U of R email, and make sure that they're on the list. But typically, ORPA accesses the, p the funded PI lists, and so if you haven't been funded already, you may not be getting these announcements. Your chairs certainly are. Kara. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, uh, what's the citizenship to permanent to residency requirement for those fellowships? I guess it's different probably. It's different for every foundation. Um, and uh, do you have to be on a tenure track position? Uh, some of them you do, and some of them they don't care. The ones I'm present I think all of the ones that I'm presenting today, you do have to be in a tenure track, track position. Um, the other thing is that once we've announced, the senior VP sends out an announcement, we give a couple of weeks to a month, depending on what the deadline is. Uh, we get these internal packages, we upload them to a share, all of the research deans vet them, and we select the one or two who's allowed to go for it. So that's sort of the first step. But all of the ones that are open, if you somehow fell off the list, not on the list, are at, on the ORPA website. But again, your chairs, you know, it, different departments handle this differently. But some chairs, for example, simply just queue their people up. They know every year there's going to be a Beckman. Every year, well, Beckman is now no longer limited, but every year it used to be limited. Every year there's going to be Packard. Every year there's going to be Pew. Every year there's going to be Cottrell. There's going to be Searle. And they just line up their faculty and, you know, and they know to sort of put you forward, even if you're unaware of the, um, of the uh, deadlines. So here's an example, and we are going to have some representatives here uh, today uh, on our panel who've received the Sloan. Here's an example of uh, some of the non-limited. So the Beckman, I just want one caveat. Katie's just been through the whole Beckman process. It's a multi, 
step process. The first process is an official letter of intent from the institution, um, and that does require the provost's endorsement. So if, you are, if you're thinking of applying for, even though it's open, we need to know so that we can line up and make sure. I think it requires two endorsements, the dean's endorsement and um, the provost's endorsement. You don't have to prepare a big spiel for them. Just let us know, and we'll make sure that you, the endorsement goes through. Sloan, there's really nothing institutionally that you need to do except go through the or ORPA process, processes. Beckman, I said, has several different, they have a, the LOI, then they have, is it a pre-application and then the full application? It's the LOI and then the full application, and then on the An interview. Interviews. Yeah, so it's, it's quite an ordeal, and it is that way for the senior, their senior awards as well, but if you get one, it's very worthwhile. Um, foundation relations, as well as Cindy and myself, we have a lot of competitive intelligence about these foundations. Um, most of the ones that I'm presenting today are ones where there's kind of an open RFP or it's a limited submission RFP. There are instructions, expectations, review criterion, pretty straightforward. But there are certainly some foundations where it really behooves you to discuss with people in foundation relations. Emily Kellis is probably the person to contact, possibly Ann Russ for the social sciences, or just contact us. They have really good information about what the foundations are looking for. So foundations are, you know, held privately. They have endowments. They must expend a certain amount of money, so they are looking to fund people just like the federal agencies are, but they have some different nuances. And um, it's very important to sort of understand the fit here, as is true with federal sponsors, but the fit here is excruciatingly important. Um, so foundation relations can help with advice. They can be a liaison to the foundation. If you have questions, they actually ask that faculty do not call the foundations themselves. Uh, they will act as a liaison if you have questions about citizenship, for example, or some other uh, one of the requirements. They can do that for you. They will help you with your narrative if you so desire. I mean, some of our faculty have had great experiences with them, and some of our faculty have felt even though they were helpful, it was like another step, and they needed to build in extra time to work with them, and it wasn't that helpful. They won't do any of the administrative pages, like budgets, uh, sign off, any of the stuff that you're used to getting support from, either from our office or from your departmental grants managers. So. We've sometimes done tag team where foundation, where someone, a faculty member wanted to work with foundation relations. They worked on the narrative with them and then maybe I helped with the budget or the grants departmental uh, grants manager helped with the budget and some of the administrative pages. Uh, but in all cases, any application to foundation relations must go through uh, ORPA sign off and actually must come to us before it goes to ORPA. Uh, and the reason being that if, we have, if you have not involved foundation relations uh, in your process, uh, we need to let them know that something is going forth. We never want there to be a situation where the director of our foundation relations is, for example, meeting with the director of the Sloan Foundation and doesn't know that X, Y, and Z at U of R have applied this year. I mean, that's just, we want them to be aware. So a lot of the, the art of foundational funding is relationship building and is very nuanced. It's kind of an advancement type of function. The particular ones that we're talking about, not so much, but we, again, never want them to be blindsided about what we're applying for or what we've received. The other thing is that most foundations either restrict, quite severely restrict, or do not allow at all indirects, which doesn't really, you probably don't care about that as a researcher because the more directs for you, the better. Uh, but as an institution, we do not, many institutions prohibit uh, faculty from applying t for funding that doesn't include indirects. We do not as a policy. So have at it and you'll hopefully you'll be successful. So I just want to talk about a few, yes? Is there a limit on, on that? So On how many times you can apply? Yeah, so is there some limit on There's not a limit on the internal applications. If you have what you think is a great idea, you can apply once or twice. Um, if you've been given the slot, that, that dear slot, the one or two slot, we will usually allow it a resubmission if you got back reviews that were very encouraging. So let's say you got the slot the first year, you applied, and you weren't successful, but they were very, you got back very encouraging reviews, we would probably give you automatically the slot the next year. Gotcha. I meant more the number of grants you get from foundations where there aren't interacts. So you have ours, no. it has no. a policy, so. No. Okay. Whatever funding you can get for your research, we encourage it, and you know, go for it. And if you can get philanthropic dollars for your research, if you can um, you know, attract a donor, um, could do, or corporate funding, could do that as well. We just need to be notified. Um, anyway, so let's talk a little bit about the Packard. Unfortunately, Vas Petrenko was not able to be here today. He was our most recent, um, I think he's on expedition, or he's away at any, in any case, but he was our most recent Packard uh, fellow uh, awardee. 
Um, we are allowed to nominate two early career faculty every year. It's quite lucrative, $875,000 in total costs um, over five years. Um, you d for this one, Kiara, you must actually be a faculty member. And they also have topical restrictions. So Packard may not be for everyone, but very successful in the physical sciences and all of the aspects of engineering, um, natural sciences. I guess I'm not seeing social science, no social science. Sorry, you guys are a little bit more, but you've got NIH. Um, highly, highly competitive. <laughs> so the, in recent years, I mean, I tried to go back to about 2000, we've only had two awardees. So Vas Petranko and uh, Dave and Presgraves in biology. Um, there, again, by contacting foundation relations, you can sort of understand what it is that the foundation is really interested in. All foundations, maybe even more so than federal agencies, are interested in kind of breakthrough science. They want to put their money behind something that a federal agency has not funded, something brand new, something that's risky, not too risky, depending on how conservative their boards are, but that fine balance. They want to be the ones that make, especially in the Packard or the Pew, they want to be that first grant that you get that's going to make your career. So they, they have that, so you know, kind of your record and your CV is very, comes into play quite a bit for all of the early investigators, but especially for Packard and Pew. This is what we expect to be the deadline. We no longer even wait to get the invitation. We assume we're going to be on the hit list for, getting, for the president getting the invitation to apply. And so Foundation Relations usually gets out ahead of this quite a, quite a bit in advance, much more than the federal programs, about six months in advance. Yes? So for instance, about the three-year requirement for someone like me who's transitioning from teaching to tenure track, uh, that three-year would be from? From your year. first tenure track position. First tenure track. I believe, but it's worth checking before you go through all the, it's worth checking with Foundation Relations. Emily Kellis is probably the best person to contact. Or you can just send us an email and we'll check for you. Other questions? Kara? Oh, sorry. It's you okay. Not, it's not really related to the Packard okay. Fellowship. It's more generally about foundational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So because many of those uh, are, are really interested in breakthrough science, uh, in your experience, would you, would you think that foundational opportunities are better if you have uh, for an exploratory project that for NSF might not be uh, that Um. It's a judgment call. I would say we, we encourage all of our faculty to have a very diverse portfolio, to have some federal funding. Corporate, if you're kind of, especially if you're in engineering, if you can, and foundational, they're harder to get. Um, and we don't know as much about them because they're privately held foundations. <coughs> we don't always know, you know how their advisory board works. They, they're certainly not peer reviewed. They're reviewed in some sort of board or some sort of board of uh, specialists. So it's a little bit more mysterious to us. Um, but certainly for the, the Packard, the expectation is not just kind of run of the mill science. Mm -hmm. It's really for something outstanding and for an outstanding uh, investigator. And just one more word about the limited submissions. So what we do when we vet those, are, we don't do it. We collect them. We provide intelligence to the research deans who vet them, is they are looking for the best proposal in that pool of proposals that year that's the best fit for whatever, whatever limited, because there's a lot of federal stuff that's limited as well, that's the best fit, and that it could be the most competitive. That they're basically only judging those applications based on that. And in many of them, we, we're competing with the medical center. So um, just for you to understand that the research deans themselves are looking at, you know, we want to get one of these, and that's what we're looking for. And we don't want to have people competing against each other, if it makes sense in that way. Um, so somebody who is, you know, we might be, we look at that as well. Right, so for the Packard, for example, let's say that we have, you know, one person in earth and environmental sciences and one person in bi biological sciences. You know, we wouldn't put forward two people in earth and environmental sciences that year, since we're allowed to. So the Pew, again, this is one of these um, really, really prestigious um, awards. Not a whole lot of money, but the prestige is huge. Um, these are the eligibility criterion, highly competitive, so they're talking about really awarding 20 per year. Um, tends to be, the research interests tend to align, this is sort of intelligence that we, we, get, we got from Foundation Relations, the research interests tend to align with who's on the advisory board that particular year and their boards switch over every three to five years. Our most recent, we have won this in the past, but not too recently, 
Ed Brown and BME had it in 2007, and uh, Laura Codley had it, she's at the Medical Center in 2005. But every year we do put forward someone. Again, these are likely to be the deadlines. I think there's a call out now, and I think we have somebody lined up for next year. So we're probably talking about the following year. Is there a limit to, um, I call it age, but really um, years since PhD for this one? I thought there was, 10 years. Uh, less than three years. Must hold a tenure track appointment less than three years as of July yeah, 1st this year. But do they have a limit for when you got your PhD? No, no. no? I, mean, if they I thought it was 10 years, no. I don't think so. Also, the other thing about the limit from PhD is that almost all of the agencies have um, exceptions for military service, for maternity leave, for if you've been teaching in a high school, you know, you were at, on the tenure track and you went and you did service in the government or taught in a high school, whatever, came back. So um, some of, sometimes it's negotiable. Um, and again, it would be very, it's worth your while to talk to Foundation Relations and have them vet those kinds of questions for you. Sloan Research uh, Fellowship, this is one that I hope you all apply for. We've been very, very successful in, uh, in art sciences and engineering on the Sloan. Not a lot of money, but again, um, the prestige is huge. Um, it's not a limited submission in any way. The one caveat I will tell you about this application is that you, it requires, I think, a letter from your chair and two or three external letters. So you're going to want to line those up early. Um, Sloan has a, has a long and very, very eminent um, both relationship with universities and supportive research. Um, so they're a very friendly, um, very friendly foundation to uh, universities. We've been, so as you can see, we've had 62 awards since 1956. And uh, Dan Weichs, John Kessler, Jessica Cantlin, and BCS are the most recent awardees. And Mike Nydick, who's going to be here primarily talking about career, but he can also talk to you about Sloan, is going to be on our panel. Um, Sloan tends to, um, all of the young investigators, but Sloan especially, tends to really focus on leadership, so scientific leadership, essentially. They do have and they, they do? Sorry, I missed it. What is it? 2011. 2011, okay. You can request an exception. Okay. Sorry. I missed that one. This is one that's a little less known to, to us. It's uh, a more recent one that we've started to be invited to, um, to uh, select nominees for, put forward nominees for. Um, we've applied a couple of times. We have not received it. But if you're kind of in the space, uh, of what they're interested in, which is basically uh, understanding diagnosis and treatment of disease, um, then it's worth taking a look at. Um, and I really don't have much experience with this one. We've only applied for it in the last couple of years. But every year, again, we have put forward someone from arts and science, art sciences and engineering. Do you know for some, something like, so you don't know like what disease encompasses if anyone would include like psychiatric? No, but um, I believe it does. But I think it's more, more, much more heavily focused on biomedical research. The other question is, when they say something like first through fourth year of a tenure track position, if you've taken maternity leave, do they generally make sense? Yeah, you'd have to, again, Foundation Relations, would it it'd be worthwhile to have Foundation Relations? If it's not on their website and not openly available, um, and they're, again, you know, the foundations are much less transparent uh, to us, intentionally so. They don't, ha they don't have to be transparent the way federal uh, programs do so they can kind of make it make up their own rules and follow their own um, their own mission and their own interests but it's definitely worthwhile working with foundation relations and getting some answers of some of the things that you're you're asking or or work with us and we'll we'll query them so now I just wanted to segue a little bit into some let's see how we're doing on time got like two more minutes um, I've got, just got a couple of slides to show you so uh, best practices this actually is for everything not just for young investigator awards Read the guidelines, it sounds obvious, but I can't tell you how many times that senior faculty, young faculty, faculty at all stages of their careers do not read the guidelines. You have to read it, read it again, read it several times. If you're fortunate enough to have a staff member who can make a cheat sheet for you or we can do that for you on a particular um, proposal, it's important to read the guidelines. Uh, it's important to identify those people who are gonna be helping you early and talk to them early, including ORPA. ORPA has a docket of uh, deadlines that they expect every day. You know, you can imagine they're not just handling your proposal, they're handling multiple. So the sooner you let somebody know, um, your departmental grant person can contact or you can contact them yourself. Your chair, if it requires a lot of recommendation from the chair, you know, you may find that if you're waiting to the last minute, your chair is gone. 
Cindy alluded to this or even spoke about it in a little bit more detail, but federal, for federal programs, it's worthwhile to do some recon, what we call reconnaissance, some sort of strategic investigation. The federal programs, not so much the Department of Defense, but NSF and NIH have places where you can see who's been awarded different grants. You can see kind of what the average budget has looked like. So it'll give you kind of a sense of, you know, what, what's not too little but not too much to ask for. You can understand that for all sponsors, it's really important that you are a good fit for their mission. That's why we put up the, what the mission of each of the sponsors is. That's critical. Um, the guidelines also contain the review criterion. That's also super critical. If there are two places that you read in the guidelines, it's read what the submission instructions are and read what the review criterion are. Um, we really encourage you so much so that we've actually put in your packet, and it's also sort of one of the pages in our handbook for young investigators that's online. Um, it's really important, especially for the Department of Defense, but actually for all sponsors, except foundational, very important to talk to the program officer. Not only to introduce yourself, your ideas, but very important to sort of feel them out about if you're a fit for their program, get them excited. Many program officers have some discretion in funding decisions. Uh, as, as you saw, not all of them are peer-reviewed, and having a good relationship with the program officers, certainly at NIH and NSF, they're scientists, many of them are rotating scientists, they like to talk about science, they don't like to do the administrative crap that they need to do, so, you know, think about engaging with your program officers. It's worth setting up a couple days and going out to Washington and hitting a couple of agencies, you know, thoughtfully. Um, so I already mentioned taking uh, notice of review criterion. Send your, build in time to take, to send your narrative to uh, colleagues for kind but critical critique. Um, it's important to start early. If you have the opportunity to work with a, a writing group or a proposal group or a red team review, it's really worthwhile doing that. Working with a mentor, if you don't have an official mentor, choose a mentor. It can be somebody who's, you know, you're up here. But choose someone who is going to be helping you and giving you feedback on your proposal, on the, on the content. We can help you and your grants management staff and your departments can help you with a lot of putting together a proposal. We can't help you with the content. We are not scholars or experts in your field. For that, you really need to reach out to your colleagues, and most of them do it happily if given enough time. So you really need to start early. Um, probably the best way to understand an agency and understand the review process is to volunteer to uh, be a reviewer. And different agencies have different criterion, um, but if you have the opportunity to do so, you know, we always say be productive of your time, don't, you know, let the departments dump a lot of responsibilities and obligations on you. But the one thing that we will say that's really important that you do do is if you have an opportunity to review, do so. You'll, it'll be an eye-opener for you of how the whole peer review process uh, works. And, and once you get an award, a couple things, and, and be sure, you know, when our panelists arrive, many, they've all reviewed. I mean, mm -hmm. they'll tell you once they receive that award. And is there anyone here that has reviewed recently or in the, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, talk to those people mm -hmm. that raise their hands if you haven't reviewed um, to understand that. So why, like, who did you review for? Uh, I was just going to say that NIH now has an early career review program, which I recently did found to be very helpful, where you apply. And they assign you only three grants, two to four grants actually, versus like the seven to nine that most reviewers have. And it's a very supportive process. So. Great. And I think in SF you can, they have an online application. And then if your expertise come up, they kind of tag you. Um, you please. Oh. The only thing with NSF is, uh, and I've been having this issue, you can't apply. That's right. And so then, right. then at the beginning it becomes this thing, I'm planning to apply, should I volunteer? So typically okay. the early career is a separate competition, so you can review for the general panel. Um, and I, so I did that my first year, and it was the best way to prepare for writing a career um, proposal. Well, I mean, I offered to review for for the, the normal ones, but they never got back to me. They said, yeah, we'll call you if we need you. They, they, still, might, they still might call you, because, I mean, they have, you know, hundreds of people to go through, and they, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but, I mean, but I'm planning to apply this year, so if they call me, I'm going to say, well, I applied, so mm -hmm. it's up to you. It's a timing say, issue. Yeah. Absolutely. Please, please, please abide by university policy of having your proposals done five business days before the, the federal deadline. It's, you know, we understand that everyone wants to tweak up until the last minute and things happen and life happens, but I can tell you that we are finding more and more situations where proposals are being thrown out without review. So you've done all that work and the fact that one little thing might be out of compliance, for example, in your prior NSF review, you didn't put in the amount or the date or something's wrong with your CV. All that's being thrown out now without review. It's the people at 
ORPA, and, and if you work through us, the same, are, you know, we're experts in compliance. And so it's worthwhile to give ORPA time to re, you know, glance through everything, make sure the page limits are right, make sure everything's in format, make sure everything that, that's there is, needs to be there. They are supporting the entire university. You can imagine how many proposals they deal with in a week. They can't do, a, if they get something in a, you know, a day or several hours before the deadline, they just, they're gonna submit it if it's before 5 p.m. or whatever the cutoff is, but they're not gonna review and then you're not gonna benefit from their expertise. And we've had several close saves by uh, abiding by the ORPA deadline. So here are just some tips on writing and editing. Start early, 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 early. You can't write a proposal overnight. You can't cram for a proposal. Writing is an iterative process. Start early, don't wait to the, la to, uh, the last minute. Um, be cognizant of the requirements for font and size, all the way from the text size to the figures to how many figures to the font within the uh, captions and so forth. Everything should be legible. Believe it or not, there still are people who review these applications in paper. So you have to, I wouldn't, we would advise going no smaller than 10 point font. Um, I do advise using italics and bold, but do it judici judici judiciously. Uh, if you overuse it, then it kind of loses its impact and effect. Same with capitals. If everything that you, you know, put in your proposal's caps, it's gonna lose its effect. Those are really used for emphasis. Be, make your reviewers happy. Use white space, use figures if they're substantive and if they can help tables. You know, the, we've heard over and over again, including from our deans who've, and, and other faculty who've reviewed, you know, when they see a proposal that is crammed with text, you know, down to the smallest font with no white space, they just look at it and like, ugh, they already hate this proposal. They're human beings just like you are. They're doing it, you know, on a tight time scale. They're doing it in between other obligations that they have. Make your reviewers happy. Make your, your proposal accessible. Those extra, whatever, paragraphs of science are not going to be worth pissing off the reviewers. Killer graphics. Yeah. Graphics are really key. Really key. And, you know, the other thing is putting in um, a photo of your, you know, if you, for NSF as an example, if you have a research group and you have students to show you doing things, you know, in a, in a research environment or in an educational environment can be very helpful. Um, Gantt charts at the end, timelines that show at a glance what your, what your um, plan is for your research and education if it's NSF. You know, simply done by task, it does, you know, doesn't have to be a whole page. It, it'll take up, you know, a third of a page. Often um, really good tips to, to include those types of things. And Nick Vavavakis will be on the panel. We'll be sure to ask him about that because we've worked together on several of these things. Um, and he's really got a system down for it now with his some of the graphics that he uses. And uh, some of them can be things that have been reworked from a, a journal article perhaps that you've got to figure in the science part that's very, that helps explain to the, the reviewer. Because the reality is the reviewers are not necessarily immersed in your technical area. They could be someone that understands your research area, but they might not be an expert in your particular research space. So you have to be able to have your proposal understood by those types of individuals because they are on the panel. Right. So that also speaks to the whole, you know, issue of jargon. What may, what you, you know, may consider that everybody knows this acronym, but again, if they're a generalist or there's someone who's not in your specific subfield of the discipline, they might not know those. Certainly, define them. Uh, don't overuse personal, personalized language. It gets very, you get very tired very soon if it's I, 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 I. Chances are you're conducting this research with your research group. You know, throw in some we's there. In your abstract or your project summary for NSF, they actually require that there be no, uh, it needs to be in third person language. Uh, no typos, obviously, if you're gonna be sloppy in your proposal preparation, then that, even subconsciously, the reviewers are gonna think, okay, are they gonna conduct the research sloppily? Are they gonna do their educational program sloppily? You know, it really needs to be as polished as it can be given the time constraints and everything else that, that you guys are doing. Um, and convey your excitement and your passion. Again, you know, that, I think that really comes through in your voice. Again, for reviewers, something is really, really dry. Doesn't sound too exciting. You know, it may be exciting, but you haven't articulated it in a way that's exciting. They're not gonna get excited about it if you don't convey and articulate that you're excited about your project. So you're gonna get these slides, but these are a bunch of places where you can find um, various different opportunities. Um, we have the Young Investigator Handbook. There's a link to it. We have it located in several places. We have a lot of stuff on the intranet. Have people looked in our Good Stuff for PIs folder on the intranet? 
So it's kind of disorganized. It doesn't, it's not, you know, it's kind of just sort of throw it up there with a title. But there is a lot of good information, including, I believe, the video for the last career uh, session that we did. Make sure you're searching for funding, Genius Smart Spin. It's, um, we have it on campus, it's expensive. Anyone can use it or you can VPN from home. Anyone who has a U of R ID can use it. Foundation directory, you can search there. But again, if you find something you think is a really good fit, it's worthwhile talking to somebody about that foundation before you actually go ahead and apply. Uh, FedBiz Ops, especially for all the DOE, Inspires, all the uh, DOD stuff. Uh, these are good uh, websites for uh, young investigators. Berkeley does a really good job of tracking all the announcements as they come out. It's also linked off of our URs Fellowships and Award database, so that's another good, um, another good resource. And then a lot of agencies have a, like an alert system or an RSS feed that you can sign up for. So it's worthwhile to be proactive and to be searching for funding, not just for early investigator, but just in general. We do the best we can by sending out regular bulletins and uh, I send stuff to chairs. I've started to send out a week, uh, kind of, I don't know, once two week STEM thing. Cindy sends out uh, uh, messages, but you know, you can't depend only on other people feeding you the stuff. You really need to be searching yourself. This is what the intranet works, uh, works looks like. Um, and the one um, page I want to um, point out to you is this grantsmanship articles. So we have a folder in there with, a, with all kinds of really good articles. Some of them will be relevant to you, others may not. You have a table of contents. There is a table of contents in the intranet, but there's also one in your packet. Um, all kinds of good articles uh, that are there. We have instructions on rigor and transparency, which is fairly new for the federal agencies. Here's the career workshop, do's and don'ts. There's a good, great article about kind of comparing the review criterion for all the different agencies and showing that essentially all the agencies are kind of, they call it different things, but are, um, but are basically uh, looking for the same kinds of things. And that's, that's the compendium. And I haven't added to it in a while, but some of them are, look old, but they are classics. Worthwhile taking some time to read the ones that are interested, that, you're, that are interesting to you. So I have a couple things I'm going to queue up, and be sure to ask our panelists this too. But I, oftentimes, as we're looking at um, submissions, it comes, there's questions about budget, and how much effort, and what kind of effort should I put in young investigator proposals. And so there's some standard rules of thumb um, for faculty or in art sciences and engineering of uh, looking at summer salary first. Um, and for a career proposal, what's 90% of the time? And you know, ask our folks, you know, one summer month is, is fairly common. Um, if, if the situation is, it, it could be a little less. It could be, we, we had a faculty member who um, already had committed a, in, a, in a situation of two summer months and we, and we thought about that and what would make sense so that they had enough effort um, within a particular application and um, so, so that's a, just a standard rule of thumb one summer month but a situation could require um, a cal some calendar year funding um, so I just want to put that out there it's always wise to be thinking about that early on our panelists are here. Great, thank you for being here. We very appreciate your time. And this is a, a great group that's very um, engaged to pick your brain. So what we're gonna do as far as format is we're gonna start, I'm gonna start with Nick, and we're gonna work this way across. Oh. Uh, put you on the spot. And they're just gonna give you a quick overview of their experience, and they're gonna take, you know, five to eight minutes. Okay. And um, and we'll have everyone kind of do the same thing, and then we'll open it up for questions. All right. So introduce yourself. And That's why you sit in the middle. Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name's Nick Mamavakis. I'm a faculty member in the optics department. I arrived at the university in the summer of 2011, uh, so I've been here now for almost six years. Uh, when Cindy and Deborah asked me to participate in this, looking back. Uh, across all of the applications I submitted, I sort of distilled out, I guess, three, three pieces of advice that I would give you. Uh, maybe it seems obvious, but I'll give them anyway. It's uh, apply, all right, apply is very important. Uh, number two is know what you're applying to. And the third point I would say is have results, and that's a little bit maybe particular to the discipline that I'm in. And so just unpacking those a little bit for everybody. When it comes to the, I guess, the apply part, I realized this morning that I probably applied to 15 
young investigator, early career solicitations, and I was successful, I would say, on one and a half of them, so I'll, exp I'll explain the half, but, but the one is, is up there was the NSF one. Uh, and, and the point, uh, there was times that I applied and I knew I wouldn't be successful, and there was times that I applied and I thought maybe I had a chance to be successful, and the point with applying is it helps you to Right, sort of distill your ideas, present present your thoughts coherently. You can, can can you get feedback from people that can be useful when you craft the next proposal. And by building up uh, a repository of unsuccessful proposals, you then have that to draw on when you write your next successful proposal. So the barrier to writing proposals goes down the more and more you write. So second, knowing what you're applying to depends a little bit, in my eyes, on the, the place you're looking to get support from. So most of my support comes from one or two places. It comes from the National Science Foundation or the Department of Defense and one of the science offices that are under the Department of Defense umbrella. And so those two, those two beasts are very different when you're we're trying to get support. So for the NSF one, when I, when I wrote the early careers, I mean, I didn't really talk to the program managers too much. I, I sought out the program I wanted to apply to or the one or two programs I thought I might be a good fit for, and I actually spent a lot of time going through their award search uh, database and just reading people who I knew were at the same level of me, as I was who had been awarded career awards and just read their abstracts. I mean, you can learn a lot from what people say they are going to do, and that can help you write a proposal that, that will be successful. Uh, the other bit now pertains, I would say, to the DOD in terms of knowing what you're applying to. I spent an inordinate amount of time, and I've said to some people in here, sending emails and making phone calls to program managers. So if I wanted to try to get, for example, the Air Force has a young investigator award. I identified the program manager in the Air Force, and this guy is so unresponsive, it's unbelievable. I must have sent him hundreds of emails without response. Now, in the end, I did not get support from him for a young investigator, but the process of trying to get to know him, and I think I heard outside, maybe it was Deborah was speaking about developing relationships. Even if you don't get the young investigator through one of these DOD solicitations, it's a great opportunity to develop relationships with the program manager. So this guy who didn't support me through the young investigator program now supports me with another, another program that I have. Uh, what else from, from talking to them? I guess the other thing you learn, at least specific to the DOD, is it's a, it's a little bit of, I'm going to take Mike's word, he told me I was at a beauty contest. Uh, and so after, after a certain amount, everybody has good scientific ideas, and, and you have to then do something to sell yourself. So the way it works for like the Navy and the, and the Air Force and the Army is the program manager chooses the, the person who they think should be supported, and then they have kind of a Hunger Games competition with all <laughs> the other program managers. And the reason they're excited is that money doesn't come out of their own, their own resources. There's a, there's a different pool of money that they draw from. And so I was told explicitly, and this was maybe a little bit uh, orthogonal to my personality in, in the following way, is that they said, you need to make explicit on the front of your proposal why you're the best person to do this and why you're better than anybody else. And so I would do this in these DOD-based young investigator proposals. Is my first page would be no scientific things, just about why I was fantastic and the right person to do that. And they said, do not be humble, because you need to make it easy for us to tell everybody else why we should support you through this call. And then the last bit was on uh, the third thing is results. Uh, when I started to feel like I was going to have success was once I had results coming out of the lab. And, and these results could be papers, conference presentations, things I could put into these proposals that would speak to my independence now that I arrived at the university. Uh, and I felt like that made them more successful. Now, for the NSF, results are a little different. In addition to the papers, you need to have something to speak to their, I guess, requirement to uh, have sort of broader impacts or public outreach in the proposal. And so, you know, thinking about how to develop a, a meaningful kind of extracurricular activity outside of the science is important, I think, for the NSF. So I spent time thinking about how to do that and came up with something that worked for me and that engaged the research in a way that sounded reasonable when I wrote the proposal. And I think those are, that's kind of unpacking those three points. I realized I didn't tell you what the half was now that I get to the end. So the half was through the Navy. I spent about a year and a half talking with one of the program managers there. And even though he did not, or I didn't win this Hunger Games competition for their Young Investigator Award, that program manager liked the work so much that he still supported it. And so because, again, this relationship was developed, even if you're not successful with the Young Investigator thing, they still can support your, support your work. So thank you. Okay, um, so I'm uh, Mike Nutty from the Department of Chemistry. Um, I think I'll focus mine as a follow-up on, on just two aspects of it. So um, I was very fortunate to have, you know, get a DOE early career, an NSF career, an NIH R01, and through the early consideration, I guess, or young consideration, mm -hmm. 
And so I think what would be useful is having gone through that process, sometimes successful the first time, sometimes not, uh, I think what I learned from that about how they're different, and this ties a bit onto what Nick was talking about. Um, I would say I, I found each of the programs to be quite distinct from one another in both uh, the structure of the review process as well as the relative, I'll use the word power, of the program manager in terms of uh, the ultimate decision. So the NSF, uh, to me, was the most, well, I'll go the other way. I'd say the NIH was the most like submitting papers, right? So you, you write a research proposal, you submit it, they have uh, proper standing committees, right, for the target area you're submitting. You know who is on it, it's listed online, right? So you have a pretty good sense of uh, what people will be reviewing your work. If there's nobody on that committee you've ever heard of, right, that maybe, maybe is worth considering finding another committee. Um, uh, because they are unlikely to, to know you. Uh, but it's properly reviewed, right? They're individual people. They go through. They uh, write up uh, uh, reviews of your proposal and then present it to the committee. And then there's a discussion and a scoring and, and all of this. And, the, uh, and so that, to me, always reminds me a lot of right, submitting papers, right? You get multiple opinions, you get comments, and also you get the chance, if you're unsuccessful the first time, to submit a revised proposal under that program uh, where it is expected that you will directly address the individual suggestions and critiques that were given. And you also have the benefit of knowing that when you go back in, that committee is basically the same. So it's the same type of people. And so in that sense, it's very much like a uh, a review, but you know the the program manager. The sense I got, and especially talking to them now, they have a little bit of wiggle room, but you know they're going to go largely upon rankings, and um, they will consider if if you bring something unique to the program that they don't have, as opposed to being the fifth example of a person doing X, um, and that I think plays in as well to the scoring. Uh, but I think the only real advantage you get in, in that program is that as a young or f new investigator, uh, your scores can be a little bit lower and, and still get funded. But it goes through the same kind of general process. Uh, the NSF is not that far off, right? It gets reviewed by, by scientists who write opinions. And then there's normally a teleconference meeting for most of these, sometimes in person, where they'll debate and discuss and rank. And, and my understanding from, from, from that and you know, others may be able to speak more to it, is I think they stick pretty close to those rankings. I don't think the, the program manager interjects themselves. Speaking to the program manager can give you a sense of if they think their program is the best fit for your proposal as opposed to another. But at least for me, I never got a sense that they were going to be able to do a lot for me as far as, oh, OK, well, you didn't get a very good score, but I really like you, right? It was very much a, a ranking. Uh, the DOE is more like the DOD in the sense that I think, the, from my experience, having uh, relationships with the program managers are essential. Uh, I've done a lot of reviews for the DOE Early Career Program as well. And I can tell you exactly how that works. I get a proposal. I review it. I get a ranking from 1 to 5, where 5 is really good and 1 is really bad. And it sends it in, and that's it. I never hear anything again, and then magically somebody does or doesn't get funded. Um, there are no committee meetings of faculty to discuss the proposals that I'm aware of. And so in that case, it, it, the program managers have a lot of uh, influence in terms of their portfolio and, and how they want to broaden out, what are the targets for their division. And so in that case, I think it's not just a pure ranking. You still have to be scored well so they can justify it. But I think it's very important with those types of organizations at the DOE to talk to the program managers in advance, get a feel for what kind of research that you know they're looking forward to funding, what types of targets that they have, and then if at all possible, targeting your research in, in those directions. Also, with the early career program or, or, or my findings through the DOE, they will have everybody, if you talk to them, they will say, well, of course you apply to the early career program because if you get funded through that, that money does not come out of their program. That's a separate program at the Department of Energy. So you're basically free to them, right? And then if your program, if your uh, proposal scores very well, but not well enough to get the early career, they will often still fund you then out of their own um, program budget. And yes. So, so given this review process, do you think the program manager has much more to say in the success of the Yes. I think at the DOE, it's, it's at least 50% program manager. Whereas if I was going to say at the NIH, I'd probably put that at 5% maybe, <laughs> right? It's, it's a completely different um, beast as far as how to approach it. Um, and so I think uh, talking to them 
if for no other reason, uh, to get a sense of what they think they're looking to add to the program, right, is very, very useful because inevitably they'll probably target funding people in those areas, perhaps even over uh, other programs or, or proposals that are more highly scored, just because we don't need the fifth person making uranium, right, sulfur compounds, but we've never had anybody do X, and we'd really like to add that. And the only way to know uh, how they view that is to talk to them. They often won't write it on paper, because as soon as they write it on paper, then they're committed to it, and, and so on. Um, and so beyond just trying to give a, a kind of a broader sense of my experience with those different agencies, because they're all very different, uh, would be to say, don't get discouraged, right? Um, I think that uh, many of us, right, can talk about the fact that you may not get funded the first time or the second time or the fifth time. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's just part of the process, right? I think the sense, one sense I got from the reviews is that regardless of what you've accomplished in your career, who you've worked for, what you've published, when you start off new, it almost turns back to, well, prove to us that you can do this. And so with the results, I think for many of these programs, it's critical that you have a, you, you more or less show them it's going to work before you ask them for money to figure out if it's going to work. It, it's kind of a, they, they want enough results to know that, you know, they won't give you $750,000 and then it all just falls to pieces. So having a, a paper or enough preliminary results to where they can look at it and go, oh, well, this is clearly going to work or they can make it work. Right, I think it's critical, even if that means, you know, maybe having to wait a little longer to put in the proposal, and 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 I think that is particularly important to consider for like the DOE early career in the NSF, where you get a limited and fixed number of opportunities to apply. Right, I think one has to be a little strategic about, you know, you wouldn't you you know, wouldn't want to run out of opportunities, right, um, in in that sense. So I know. I think people would disagree with me, but my general view is that I don't think for things like the NSF career or the, or the DOE or the NIH necessarily anyone should be applying in the first year, that they're faculty just because you won't have any results, right? Um, but the process of applying can be very useful as well. So it's, 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 it's something to consider, right? The only risk you run starting year one with the NSF is by the end of year three, Right, you might have already used up all three of your, your, your tries, and now you're starting to get lots of papers out, but you're no longer eligible. So it's, it's a, an individual, I think, strategic choice on that side. Um, so, but yes, don't get discouraged, right? We all get rejected a lot. And when you submit your first paper as an independent <laughs> person, you will see it as well. <laughs> so, yes? Can you, can you speak at all about this song, about that process? Oh, that's a beauty contest. Um, um, <laughs> So the Sloan, Dreyfus, some of these uh, private organizations, um, I will tell you my experience and I will tell you things I've heard from senior faculty. So you'll write a, a brief summary of the research you're doing, a CV. It'll get sent out to senior established full professors in your field of study. Um, I don't know what happens, and you get no feedback from these organizations, right? You'll simply get a letter at the end of the day, you know, yay, you were selected, or, you know, we had lots of great applicants and you weren't selected. The sense I get from people I know that have been on it is it's, it's more if you're known. And that can be through papers you published, through groups you came through, through institutions you were at, through conferences you've attended. Uh, for example, I know for, for the Dreyfus, one of my colleagues said they were literally not even sent the applications once. They were just sent a list of names and asked to rank them. And so when it comes down to situations like that, you know it's just, do they know who you are? Which means they already have to know who you are and, and what you're doing. And even I think if the applications are involved, there's a bit of that. And that's why I call it a beauty contest, right? There's a bit of, uh, and, and so I don't think it's worth applying to those any earlier than you have to. Since I think it's so tied to do people know you, do you have a reputation in the field, right? Um, the Sloans normally are given to people in their fifth year, um, so that would be the appropriate year to apply. Um, there is no university restriction on how many can apply to the Sloan. Um, um, and so, um, yeah, it's. You, I think to give yourself the best chance there, just publish as many papers as you can, go to lots of conferences, make sure people know who you are um, by that point. 
Um, I, my personal take is what you write doesn't matter for the description. It's mostly going to go on your CV and whether or not they know you. Um, well, which ties to that, right? right? For the letters of support, you need to choose really famous people in your field, right? right? So one has to be your chair. Yeah. So you want to pick the most highly esteemed. Yeah. And you don't want to just choose people you've worked for. I think you want one or two highly esteemed people in the field that you didn't work for to help to broaden out that you've had a significant impact in, in the field. You know, um, and so it, it is worth considering. You, you want really big name people uh, to write those letters because, again, not everybody on that committee, right? You know, I'm an inorganic chemist. Even at this point in my career, a lot of the physical chemists aren't going to have a clue who I am. That's just how academics work. And so if you need the physical chemists on the panel to agree to you being chosen, you know, you would like that some of your letter writers are big enough people that at least they know who the letter writers are. And they may not know you, but they know them. And if they say that you're good, then that's good enough. So, uh, but it is, it is a, the way I view those is no matter how much you've done, no matter what the letters say, your best odds are 50-50. I think that's about true. But you, you apply, right? And there's, there's nothing to be lost. The applications for those are really not a lot of work. It's more of a summary of what you've done, right, and where you're going, and a CV listing your accomplishments in some letters. It's not an arduous process. In fact, they even limit, I think, the page numbers quite, quite heavily, which makes it actually difficult to, to fit it in. So. Um, you should definitely try for that. It's not a lot of money. That's more for the prestige than the money. My name is Christy Petrenko. I am a research psychologist over at the Mount Hope Family Center and also part of um, the clinical and social sciences and psychology. Um, and my experience has been entirely with NIH. Um, I was awarded a career development award through the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism um, in 2011. Um, I actually started at University of Rochester in 2011, and which meant that I wrote the uh, K Award while I was a postdoc. Um, my husband is also faculty here, so I knew we were both coming, um, and so I was trying to be strategic in writing the career award. Um, I am not tenure track, so if I don't have grants, I don't have a job. <laughs> so <laughs> I write a lot of grants. Um, and so the career development award, the KO1, was really an optimal mechanism for the kind of work um, that I wanted to do and for starting off here in a new position. Um, now, each institute, NIH, administers their career awards a little bit different from what I've seen. Um, the percentage of research funds allowed and the percentage of um, your FTE that's covered can vary a little bit by institute, and you can find that all online. But at the time that I had my N uh, K01, um, NIAAA was funding 75% of your salary and a 50000 uh, for research funds per year. Um, which worked really quite well for what I needed to do with, for the most part, minus the sequestration that happened to the grant. But um, that still was able to proceed. So um, for me, having 75% of my time protected for this award, um, my, a lot of my work is in intervention research. And so it gave me really these two years I sort of saw as a luxury to be able to go to um, consultants' labs and visit them, some of the senior researchers in my field, um, to be able to do some qualitative research, which is hard to get funding for, to really figure out what types of interventions are really needed. Um, and it just gave me an opportunity to really delve in and make sure I was putting the best product together for the, interven the intervention trial, which I did in my last three years. So it was a five-year grant. Um, I would say that some of the things that helped, I think, being successful um, in getting this award, um, I did have some pre- and postdoctoral institutional and individual training grants uh, through NIAAA and NIMH, um, which, you know, at the K level, they're looking to really invest in people. And so I think seeing that I was coming up through this pipeline um, and being able to continue to invest was um, very helpful. Um, I would say a lot of the networking um, that I had experience with, um, I had a very savvy uh, senior PI when I was in graduate school who really understood how NIH works. And so at conferences, he would be like, OK, you are my shadow. We are going to meet people. And I was like, OK. Um, and at the time, I was like, oh my gosh, this, like, why am I following him around introducing these people? But when I went to go develop a consultant team um, for my career development award, 
I had I knew who to email and I could just email them they knew who I were who I was and agreed to be on it um, which was really key I think it was also important um, I had met some of the program officers throughout that process um, as well as um, actually the director of NIAAA at the time had a real interest in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder so I had met and he knew who I was as well um, I was told by my program officer after I got my score that I was on the bubble range which meant that I did not meet what they would normally put under the pay line, but I was in this zone where they could kind of pick and choose. Um, I had also a high priority area for NIAAA, given that I was interested in intervention for kids with FASD, which was a very understudied area. And so I know that they came in and picked mine out of the bubble area, so that, that was very helpful. Um, I think also the career development mechanism is a little tricky because you have to show that you are very promising and that um, you have expertise in some areas, but then you also need expertise. So you have this balance of like, I am good at these things, but I also need this area. And so um, I think that's just something you have to kind of play with um, a little bit. I, you also need to have a coherent story and your program of kind of your research trajectory even if you have to do a little bit of like revisionist history about how the things go together and at the time maybe it wasn't strategic but you need to kind of make it sell a story that you are developing this independent uh, research career and that this mentored experience is going to really push you to where you need to be to have that um, so I think that's a really key piece to highlight and they also want to see that you are going to put in an R01 equivalent application um, by the end of it and that this is going to lead to an independent they want younger and younger people to bring down their average of their first <laughs> career <laughs> war, <laughs> basically so and I would suggest in that way that you don't put you're going to submit your R01 in year five because um, I have submitted, so I submitted my R01 application, I think at the end of year three, beginning of year four, and I'm now on my fourth round, which I think may actually have a really good chance of getting funded through like a project that really flowed well from that. And I've learned a lot through those revisions and different mechanisms of writing that R01 application. And so you want to really give yourself time, especially if you don't have a tenure track line to fall back on or to have to support you. Um, I also think the institutional support is pretty important for a K award. Um, on my, while well, I was a postdoc, there were a number of people either applying for R01 or R21s or K01s and thinking about um, which direction to go. And some of the folks had difficulty getting that institutional letter to apply to a K because without the K award, they wouldn't necessarily have a faculty position. Um, and so it, I think it's probably going to vary on institution, but many institutions won't support your application for a K01 um, if there's not like a position. Does that make sense? Um, and so some folks had trouble, at least at the University of Denver where I was applying, that they wouldn't, couldn't get a letter of institutional support that they were supporting this person without some other funding source. Um, so that was something that uh, we were able to do. Um, let's see, there was some other. I think another thing that helped was having starting off a much earlier than probably even necessary to write the grant. Like I gave myself six months to write the career award. Now some of that was built into how my postdoc was set up that we were expected to do that. Um, but to get letters from all the consultant people to really form a coherent plan and not only your research plan, but your a big part of what you're evaluated is on your training plan and kind of how those dovetail together. And that took a lot of time. And especially if you want people to review it and get feedback. Um, I also got examples from colleagues or other people who had had successful K awards um, and used those as sort of models and saw what was helpful and what wasn't helpful in writing those. Um, I think those are some of my main points. Um, if any, you know, is thinking about writing a K01 and wants to see an example, I, I would be willing to share um, mine as well or discuss individually ideas. Um, but I found that helpful. So I'm Chen Ling from ECE, and uh, actually my suggestion here is uh, before I forgot it. So one thing is uh, one thing is very important here is. Uh, I know actually we are, you know, particularly in a very early stage, 
usually we have a lot of great ideas we got excited about what we are doing but one thing keep in mind don't put all ideas into one proposal <laughs> and that's very important because during the review there's one chance I think I review uh, I, I participate in the, the the panel of the career proposal a lot of them are very very good they are really good actually to be honest with you they are much better than what I did <laughs> and uh, they are from very prominent universities but the, the, the trouble here is uh, they just put everything together piece by piece uh, and a lot of each of them they can be carved out become very good proposal but probably they feel very excited about everything and put together and nobody buy it and nobody see a very clear plan what you are going to develop with it so, so my suggestion is that I think that this most important piece I want to uh, I want to deliver to you is really actually carve the have a very clear thing whatever write it down and what you want to develop and have a very coherent story and a theme towards that and don't just put anything here it, I actually I did when I first wrote my first career proposal, it was so badly reviewed. And I, I really got very upset about it. The review actually you got is much worse than the review you get reject of paper though. <laughs> because they say something very nasty, but don't care about it, just neglect it, okay? Because it doesn't help at all. But anyway, so this is the one thing is very, very important. We didn't make a very good story about it. And uh, for, um, for the NSF, I think my experience here is uh, no, probably all, all, all the proposal. I, one thing actually probably very important is pay attention to the format. And this happened to me. I didn't get any grant for the first three years, first three years, I won't say any, but the majority of my proposal was rejected on the first three years. The reason is that at the third year, I found it's because of the format issue. And the reason why I know that is because one of my friends was happened to sitting in the panel with my proposal. And he know how the proposal was rejected. And he told me the story. And now I realize that actually that matters. So pay attention to that. The two things here. One for uh, NSL, and I agree with, uh, with Nick. I think it doesn't have, at least my personal experience, it doesn't help when you talk to program manager. The program manager has very little power to control that. It's a panel control that. And, but for DOD, really, like DARPA or something, the program manager is extremely powerful. And he designs everything. So then and I will talk about that one a little bit later. And for NSF one, it's really actually the formatting wise matters. You need to put quite a lot of um, even, you know, you know even, even, well, from research point of view, it's probably is bullshit. But you have to somehow to write down how you want to develop not only just the research part, or potentially a little bit on education part. And turns out actually they like it in some way. Of course, idea is most important, okay? So this here. The other thing actually my suggestion here is when you write a proposal, and usually don't put everything like your preliminary data or something in one single section. And now you say what are going to propose in the future. That does not work. It does not work in whatever proposal in which maybe I think you have a different opinion, but I think that whatever I think the DOD proposal what I load is similar. They just don't like it because usually they don't spend a huge amount of time to read to read your proposal. You need to show somehow, whenever you propose any ideas, show something or the data or anything you support it. Writing a way, you know, it gradually tells a story into that. Uh, am, I, am I clear? Uh, did you get my point? Okay, so, so my, this is actually how to say it. Okay, anyway. So now, now and for the, 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 the DOD related agency, my experience, I didn't get any kind of whatever an AI was gathered from there. But just from regular proposal wise, and my suggestion is I really agree with Nick. Talk to them. And that's just the most important thing to talk to them. I find actually nowadays, probably actually the agency also like to talk to young investigators, young, at least talk to PIs. Because that is where their ideas from. So let me give one simple example of DAPA. I think both office, our uh, DL, DSO and uh, MTO, and they actually, not only you can talk to them regularly and on a regular basis, even they have an annual call proposal day and where they start to correct all the white papers. And that I found that turned out to be a very good mechanism. So that really try to try to talk to them, send a white paper to them, and be patient. I think that my experience is usually take a lot one month, even sometimes two months, you get response to them. They have so many emails, they don't just, don't, don't just look at that. 
And the funny thing here is I found, if you will find a new program manager, they just joined it a year ago, or recently, really contact them. <laughs> that is they want to build a connection, and they want to reply to you. And for those very senior program manager, <laughs> usually they don't reply, so you have to be patient. So this is actually is a, so something, it, but I mean, I com agree with uh, Nick. Talk to them, and really talk to them is the one make it work. And uh, they, they have just got so many emails and so many, you know, white papers. They do not know you, and they, they will not reply to it. They sometimes they even just regret it. Okay. Questions? Your chance. The panelists for us. So, uh, one question for the panel. Um, Peer-reviewed awards versus non-peer-reviewed awards. Uh, which one do you think has the more success? Uh, or, you know, what was your experience about that? I've only had peer review awards, but it was helpful to integrate their feedback, even if it's difficult to read. After a month, you look at it again, and there's usually some really good nuggets that can help you reframe your resubmission for those kinds of awards. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I guess to kind of echo what Mike was saying, I, I think nominally most things are peer reviewed. It's just how seriously it's taken. Yeah. And so like with maybe the DOE and the, the Department of Defense, I mean, I've reviewed proposals for the different science offices in the DOD, but at the end of the day, the program manager ultimately makes the decision. And so in terms of success rate, if you know the pro program manager is going to support you, then you're definitely going to be successful when you send the proposal. So if you can cultivate these relationships and have it so that they are asking you to send them something, then your expectation right, that things will be successful. I think that your understanding the review process is really key. So, you know, NIH and NSF are much more transparent than the Department of Defense, and certainly in foundations, uh, which aren't transparent at all. And most of the foundational things that you apply to, you won't get any critique back whatsoever. Um, so for NSF and NIH, they have a, it would be egregious if the program manager were to go against the panel. Um, so and they might be able to, in conversation, bring people a little closer together if there's a wide uh, difference of opinion. But they're not allowed to, you know, think of it sort of from a political point of view, they're not allowed to say, you know, this panel of experts are, their opinion is not worthy, I'm gonna make the decision. So they're more there as a facilitator and a moderator and an administrator. I think for the um, Department of Defense, those program officers probably have written the solicitations. And, and a lot of times the programs change in the Department of Defense based on who the program managers are and what their key interests are. And so the relationship, uh, cultivating some sort of relationship with them, I think really is, is, is we have heard, I don't know from my own experience, but we have heard is really key. I mean, one so, other comment I would have. Oh, go ahead. You want to, so go ahead. I, I was going to slightly walk away from this, but so if you're going to respond to that, I can hold off a second. Okay. So, like a DOD, the program manager, they are very powerful. And uh, I know actually, this is just from side information, not from the reference program manager. Sometimes they get a review. The DOD, I don't know what the other agency, but DOD, they have internal, the, I think the DARPA actually, they have internal review system. They go with the contractor. This is how they review that. And go to other program managers, like from FSR, ONR, something they review that. After they collect the, the review comments, they can over, overturn that. Actually, sometimes the program, it depends on personality of program manager, they pick up a proposal even they have very low review. So this is why relationship matters a lot. So. The, the other thing I just want to mention as far as NSF is, at least is concerned, is that they, each program manager has a portfolio and they like diversity within their portfolio in, in every way, age, gender, uh, ethnic diversity, regional diversity. So they don't like, you know, they don't like it when NSF looks like a map that's only funding the East Coast. You know, if there's somebody, if your score is the same as somebody out in Idaho, they might end up funding the Idaho. You know, they have that sort of discretion, but not going against the panelists. And by the way, if she, about, you know, receiving reviews, you know, read them, set them aside, never call up the program officer when you're angry, never. We've had people who really ruined their careers this way by letting the program officer know that you know they hate them, they think they're idiots, and the panel was stupid, and nobody got their science, and you know it's really not worth it. Read them, and but also read them with a grain of salt. I mean, you're, you can disagree, even if you're going to write for NIH. 
and you have to actually give a one-page summary of how you're responding to the critique, you can respectfully disagree with what someone has said and explain why. You know, you're a scientist in your own right. And the other thing is that I, I would also highly, highly advise against re rebutting a decision. Um, I think it hurts you more than it, than it will help you, ultimately, just because of the way that NIH is set up. First of all, you're insulting your peers and your betters, or your more senior, by rebutting. But it's, it's not usually fruitful. It antagonizes people. And um, there's only one case that I know of the bar where we advised against a rebuttal. The, the, program, the faculty member went forward with the rebuttal in any case, and actually the decision was reversed. So um, very rare for them to reverse the decision. Um, and you guys are lucky because you're in STEM. I can tell you for NEH, which is the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, the reviews are actually quite subjective um, with no you know, evidence-based kind of logic necessarily to them. Uh, much more of a beauty contest, as Mike said. I think serving on a panel, too, can really help you have um, better insight into where the reviewers might be coming from. <laughs> After having done the process, I think I have more compassionate to what some of the reviews and what, you know, the quality of the reviews I get back and what that might be coming from. Yeah, I, I can re sorry, I second to that. And that's, uh, is very, very important. And particularly like uh, the like transparent agency, like ASF or something like that. And you know how I discuss it internally. To be honest with you, those comments you get, you written down, sometimes it really not they really discuss it. And when they start to reject your proposal, my experience is that they just put something there to tell you they want to reject you. And this particularly, some, for example, you will get some kind of review. It doesn't make any sense, right? But they say that because they need, by law or by something, they need to put something there to make sure it's, you are rejected. But it's not really they really internally discuss it. Though. So pay attention to go participate on the panel. It is what I really agree with that. I forgot to say that. And that two things here. One actually is you really know how proposal you, you you see a lot of proposal, right? And you'll get a lot of samples, you know how people write in this way and you read the other way. You like it or you you, you, want, you want you want to do a similar way, you know. The second thing you will know what they are internally discussing and you know how program officer they participate in the discussion. Sometimes, some of them, they have a very strong personality. They want to tailor to some other direction. And some, there's one time, and then there's one panel. It turned out it just probably just because of luck. That all the panel doesn't like one specific direction, the one area. The whatever, how good a proposal you wrote. It is just a panel, they don't like it. So they have some kind of internal, but they never say this kind of thing on, on the comments. So yeah, so that's why I participate to the panel is really actually helps a lot. If you don't participate in the panel, but if once you get the reviews and once you've sat out in a while and you haven't picked up the phone and started reaming out your program officer, and a month later or whatever, you request an appointment with them, sometimes the program officers will give you a sense, a more nuanced sense of what was really going on in the panel than what's actually written on the page. You know, well, really, you know, like for example, even even Christy said that she, you, you sort of found where you were, you know, kind of in the range, and you got some extra insights. So all of that is really valuable intel. We're all about, you know, being strategic. Um, we wanted to ask Nick about um, the actual proposals that you write. With the, well, so so we, I work with Nick quite a bit, and um, he's got a great use of graphics and timelines figures using a picture of a student if there's an outreach component. So like I guess as Chan was mentioning a little bit, right, uh, this maybe ties back into my, what my other point was going to be is first, when the people ingest the proposal, right, you kind of psychologically have to think of what they're going to be thinking when they look at it. So how you do that is think, well, how would I feel if I had a stack, right? We've all heard this, a stack of proposals to go through. So I tried, my formatting is very particular for anything that I submit. The first page is always uh, very high level. Here's why this is so great. Here's the problem it's resolving. There's always a flashy graphic. Lots of times I work with the creative services people on campus to develop something that is much better than I can do myself with PowerPoint or some other thing. And then, yeah, and then anytime I want to make a point, I, I try to make it, of course, in the text for someone who's really interested. But if it's an important point, I also try to make it graphically so that you can quickly thumb through and, and get the main, main, the main message in, in two to five minutes. And so after you've gone through the first two pages of my proposal, either you like it or you don't like it. If you don't like it, that's fine. If you like it, great. And you can dig into the details that are, that are afterwards. But then getting back to the psychology thing, I, I, why I think these young investigator programs are also useful for me was, I mean, I heard a lot, you know, you have to cultivate these relationships. Go talk to program managers. Tell them what you're doing. And 
I always felt at the beginning very intimidated with this idea of showing up and telling someone, here's what I'm doing, here's why it's so fantastic. And I, I, I realized that these young investigator opportunities were such an easy way to make a phone call to any program manager and start a conversation where you're not asking them for something, you're not trying to tell them how great you are, you're just saying, hey, I see you guys have this young investigator program, could you tell me a little bit about it? And then you have start having a dialogue going back and forth, and then once you get their guard down, they're not hanging the phone up because they have a hundred other things to do, then you can start getting getting a feel for, oh, by the way, what kind of stuff do you like? Oh, here's what I do. And then you start building that relationship, and the door opens up. And I, and I found that was with any of the program managers I interact with now. I interacted with them first through this, just on these kinds of conversations that weren't even based on science. They were just based on trying to get on their radar before I started telling them about all the things that I was doing. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to have a, a non-threatening, you don't have to feel, I mean, it's very naked maybe on the phone when you're trying to tell somebody very quickly, you know they want to hang up all the things that you're going to do and how are you going to, how are you going to you know, do this great science, but they, they all seem to be very willing, like some of the uh, other panelists have said, to talk about these young investigator programs because I think that they think that they're important. So it's a way for you to get their guards down and get them to talk. Yeah, I want to add one word on what Nick said, is that when you talk to them, they can tell you something which is not on the paper. Because sometimes you read what they want, but actually, it sometimes is different what they really want. And so just because they can give you um, something, you know, just by talking to them. And that turned out to be sometimes it's very, very important. Even just for a regular proposal. is that just they can give you something. Oh, this is actually what they, exactly what they want. You have to say specifically some way and just like what Nick said. So I was going to add two things. One about the NSF, and it was about, you know, not getting upset, right, on feedback. I think I've known many colleagues at other institutions, right, who, you know, you don't get the proposal funded from the NSF, and they give you a lot of feedback. And, and they'll go, oh, well, I'm okay. They don't like this. I'm going to rip this all apart. And they do that, and they submit it the next year. And now, all of a sudden, the review says, well, wait, why don't you have this in it? You know, and the, and the reason is that unlike the NIH, the NSF, the panel can change completely from year to year. So, so my advice would be, to take the time to critically think about the feedback you get, talk to the program manager about anything else, but you know, don't necessarily throw everything under the bus if you think it is still important because the composition of the panel is going to change, right? And and um, and the second thing is, as someone who's reviewed a lot of these these DOE early career awards, and I think this is true for anything, if you have a 15-page limit, please fill out all 15 pages. You know, if you get a proposal that's 13, you know, I think the expectation from writing them as well as reviewing them is you should struggle to fit everything you want to do in 15 pages. If you submit a 12-page proposal, you know, they're looking at all of these proposals. Anything at all that sets you apart in a negative way that they don't expect will probably destroy your application. So, you know, don't use bigger, you know, if they don't even specify the font, don't, don't use really big fonts and giant figures to fill out. It should look like you struggled to fit everything into 15 pages. But not so much that there's you, yeah. there's no white space. <laughs> yeah, not so much that there's no white space, but you don't want it to come up short of the limit because... Yeah. Yeah. So I agree with that. Particularly for NSL, keep in mind, you want to fill it up to the last line, okay? And this is the discussing panel. Really, it's a few, quite a few times on my participant panel, they discuss it. They, for example, if they don't say anything, it's okay. But if they really find, want to comment on that, say, oh, this is not clear, but they have space to that. Why not they just to say a little bit more? And you, know, you see? So this is the key to that. So really, it's a psychological issue. And, but for the DOD proposal, I don't know what the young people get the part. I think for other proposal, it's not so critical. But you see, the NSF one really, the panel is crazy. It's just, <laughs> it's really crazy. So It's, it's unpredictable in the NSF. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to circle back up the panel and then echo Hanway's point from before. It seems like at the beginning, getting on a panel is kind of a chicken and egg problem. Depends. Uh, like, you know, I've, I've also had this experience where I talk to them on the phone, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can go to the panel. And they say, okay, sure, fine. We'll I'm fine. So, do you just have to sort of do this once and either get it or not get it, and, and then you'll, you'll be called to be on the panel? Is that, is that just how this works? Or is there a way to sort of jumpstart this and get on? I, ha I have this issue. I would email them. Like right out, if I didn't submit a proposal that round, I would email them like a couple weeks after the due date when they're thinking about you know creating panels. And it worked. Yeah, I mean, it was on two panels. Yeah, it works. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the hard part though is that you can't be on a panel for which you submit to, right? So you got to find something related that you think you can review for or that's close enough that's you know. 
So the, the two way helps for ASL or something like that. You just volunteer that because those program manager is very difficult themselves to find people to participate in a panel. Nobody wants to do that. And why we bother to travel to 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 DC and then to just, just wait a couple of days to do that? It's just it doesn't make sense. So that's why they like whatever people. I mean, young particularly young PIs, they like you to participate on the panel, and they cannot find people to do that. So just volunteer, send a e couple email to different different panel, different category. And the other thing I found help actually for me, and like a DOD, I think the program manager, sometimes it's very difficult to get to talk to them, right? It's, it takes a lot of time. You somehow as a senior faculty help you to introduce to them, and that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of, particularly talk to the department, if you're a senior faculty, who for me, actually, there's an independent original that has a professor, it's a Philip Fauché. And uh, he actually helps quite a lot in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he talked to the program manager, he just mentioned my name somehow, and the program manager emailed me or something. So, so I think that... Yeah, I yeah. would say the same. My graduate yeah. advisor, who I mentioned, was pretty savvy and is very knows a lot of the program officers and the structure he had served on in a AAA council a number of years ago. And when I was talking about applying for the KO1, I was asking who he would recommend I talk to, and he actually just sent an email without replying back to me and said, "Here." You know, and he knew a good person. He's like, I had this great student who, you know, was interested in a K award. Can you help direct her to where she needs to be? <laughs> and then that person who knew my advisor very well emailed me back right away. And I was like, okay, I guess we're having this conversation now. <laughs> you know, so the more that senior folks can help transition and create those relationships, I think is probably really helpful. And I think even, even just by submitting to the NSF, like in my first year, I sent a bunch of proposals. I didn't get funds, but then you are on the database. So then in subsequent years, program managers, basically, you get an email, you sign up a form, and then based on that, that's what uh, public provides. I think reviewing for the NIH, it, it's, it seems to be, I don't know much about the other um, uh, it's types of um, funding programs, but it's if you're a standing member, it's member. It's a like th I think three year commitment, yeah. um, and so I think the main way to get on some of those panels as an early investigator is kind of going through that early career reviewer program. Um, they may also, after you've kind of done that, and if you seem to do pretty well, they may invite you to come back as like a post hoc member because they'll have grants. Like sometimes my grants will go in. There's just not that many people that do the kind of work that I do, and so they'll often have to bring in a post hoc reviewer for my grants, but. Um, I think that's probably the main way. And then I think once you get like an R01 or something, I think that's how then they decide, oh, I want this person to be on the standing committee, which I hear is quite a lot of work. And the one thing I wanted to add is take all the opportunities that we may uh, meet them in conferences, oh, yeah. all the social events. I was emailing one program manager for almost a year, and I never heard back from her. I met her in a Women in Science breakfast for 20 minutes in the conference, in that conference of event, and I received an email like a week after that, that yeah. social email from her. So it, it really helped just meeting them in person. Also, not all program officers are created equal. <laughs> I was it was actually kind of funny, but in a sad way. When we were at the NSF meeting, you know. And NSF has this mantra, you know, ask early, ask often, contact your program, you know, they want to engage, and they do want to engage, and they do partner in a way that other agencies don't with the scientific community. And so all with they are the program officers of all the major programs. So the, the program officer for SBE, which is like economics and um, brain and cognitive sciences and psychology, was like, yeah, but don't email me. So they were all like in a line, they were saying, yeah, call me, you know, email me, talk to me. And they went down the line and they was like, yeah, but I don't answer any emails, so just don't even bother. And you know, it was hard to tell if he was joking or not. You know, he's kind of a gruff guy, and you know, maybe he, and he's you know, there are people who are lifetime program officers and then people on rotation. So the rotators are going to come back to academia, and there's an event, a benefit to them to meeting the young and the best and the brightest faculty. The people who are who are kind of we call them lifers at the agency. We had another experience in chemistry actually when um, sequestration was going to happen, and we had two different professors at the institution whose grads were in peril. And one program officer was like really great and you know, as soon as I know something, I'll let you know and very, very personable. And the other um, program officer was like, you know, what I know something it was just very abrupt and very, you know, that was just his style, very gruff. It's like, you know, you know what I know, stop bothering me. Um, you know, he can say that, but it's similar. So, you know, and two faculty members had a very different experience. Okay, thank you.
Oh, yeah. We want to thank our panel. Uh, we appreciate it.